to start us until Mr. McManette comes. to open our briefing work session. Today is February the 7th, 2023. Timestamp 503. Our intention was to dispense with the executive sessions at the outset, take care of those, and then move on to other matters. Our attorney is stuck in traffic somewhere. So we are now going to have to rearrange what we wanted to do, tie in with the times, tie in with the subjects that we have, tie in with the individuals that are out there, that are here present to hear that particular piece of information in that discussion, uh, which, by the way, even though it shows, uh, no, I'll take that back. It is, yeah, it is. Side there. Um, let's just go ahead and take care of the consent items. Okay. We'll dispense with those. Mm -hmm. uh, on our consent agenda, this we have item 4A consider a resolution authorizing a cooperative purchasing agreement with Cummins Inc. to procure an emergency <coughs> generator for the power station 271 Resource World Contract 092222. CMM is in the expenditure amount of $125,907. Uh, on January 18, 2022, Council approved using ARPA funds to procure emergency generators. As the Public Safety and Emergency Operations Facility, the building will require emergency power and generation during outages. The reason we are doing this right now is the current lead time for equipment is about 44 to 54 weeks. Uh, Cummins is headquarters in Columbus, Indiana, and uh, we are working on this process now in preparation for our new fire station. Item 4B, consider a resolution authorizing the term procurement of tree maintenance service with Pace Paysage Group doing business as Smith Lawn and Tree in the unit amount, bid amount, through the City of Grapevine RFB 15, 515, 2022 with an estimated expenditure amount 
of $75,000. City of Grapevine rebid this service last year. The Parks Maintenance Division along with the Streets Division will utilize the contract for routine tree maintenance to improve citywide tree health by eliminating dead and dying <coughs> Healthy trees are essential to the air quality, shelter of a variety of species, species, and are linked to the improvements of emotional health. Contract yes, sir. Oh, we need to talk. Oh. Contract agreement will be a critical aid in helping stay in compliance with our city ordinance 1843, chapter 12, as well as maintaining our tree city USA status by spending at least two dollars per capita on urban forestry. Yes, sir. Um, there was a little, I had a little bit of confusion when I read this uh, because of the dates uh, September 2022 to September 2023 why we're doing this right now just for the benefit of everyone can I ask uh, Mr. Stevenson to explain briefly the way you explained to me what that's all about absolutely Mr. Stevenson, yes, sir. Uh, thank you um, yes the city of Grapevine this is a piggyback contract to do with the city of Grapevine um, the previous contract had run out of renewals so they rebid the project last end of last year um, so that September 2022 day is the date that they signed an agreement with uh, this new group. And uh, now we want to utilize those services as well. So we're entering into a contract with them now uh, to uh, get us through this September through this fiscal year. We have not used any of their services to date. So presumably in September 2023, there's a renewal call. There'll be a renewal. We'll come back to you guys with another renewal. We will get a full year out of that service. Well, fiscal year 24, that's correct. Thank you. Item 4C, consider resolution authorizing the purchase agreement with Park Place Motor Arlington to purchase a cargo van and the expenditure amount of not to exceed uh, $79,686. Uh, the SWAT van has, has outlived its uh, operational capacity, lacks functionality, air conditioning, and is uh, undersized and is unsafe due to mechanical issues. We've been working on this procurement for quite a while, almost since I've been here, and a new SWAT van would would give us the increased headspace and necessary space that our uh, officers need. Uh, Park Place Motors of Arlington has agreed to provide this van specifications at a selling price of not to exceed, as I mentioned earlier, $79,686. Uh, just to insert a comment here, I know that several of us participated in some uh, training mm -hmm. recently held by our police department, and we were able to actually examine this vehicle that our SWAT team is using, and it is decrepit. It is bad. Uh, it's way out of its usefulness, and uh, you know some of our police officers showing us how that van is used and how it's deployed in certain circumstances. Has no air conditioning. Uh, they can't stand up in it. I mean, they've got like 60, 70 pounds of gear on top of whatever they've got and everything else. Uh, to see that particular van in operation. And knowing what we need to do to replace it, this is this is absolutely necessary for our police force to have this. So, given the fact that we have a vehicle replacement plan, how does uh, a van like that that is so needed by the police department and we are in the city, how does the van will get into that perfect position and not already have been? So we began this process probably right when I got here, and we have been trying to purchase one that was suitable. One was ordered last year, uh, and that one was not appropriate. We wanted one with doors on both sides. So we've had a very difficult time through our procurement of purchasing this uh, and identifying it. Ultimately, I went to the police chief and said, can you all help find it? So working with our chief procurement officer, we went out of our traditional process of purchasing, which is through our cooperative agreements, and went directly to a vendor and said, we need this. And so it was, uh, it should have been replaced, and we have been trying to replace this now for about two years at least. So if we went outside our normal channels of purchasing, should we not be kind of needs and your specifications? Yes, and that's the normal channel. We did not receive any bids of what we were looking for and what they needed. Uh, Asa is here and can tell you a little bit more about his journey, if you don't mind, of securing uh, our SWAT van. We, uh, Come on as, in, Asa. as you probably know, every year we review the rotation schedule. And it was in 2019 uh, that it was decided to go ahead and replace it. 
and it was ordered in 2019. And after several months, uh, almost a year, it came in and it came in wrong without all the functionality that the police needed. So it was reordered, and then almost a year later, it came in wrong again. And then that's when we uh, went to this other process to be able to identify um, the manufacturer who provided all the options because there were only, I think there are only two now uh, that do Dodge and uh, Mercedes. And so, and then uh, it was put out for solic uh, solicitation uh, after uh, nailing down all the specifications, making sure that the manufacturer uh, could provide that. And then after the solicitation came in, it was awarded in the uh, uh, staff report was made, and here we are. So it, it's been a long process. Thanks for your persistence. <laughs> well, the police department played a big part in it, too, because this is a, uh, a specific use van. It's not something that you just go in and buy off the street. Uh, there's a lot more to it. Thank you. I think probably the word use of the word journey is understated. <laughs> Perseverance is a well term. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. Uh, Mr. Mac Burnett, please come in. Thank you, Mr. Harper, pointed out. It's, it goes back to all of our vehicle and equipment. There is such a backlog on it, we are just having a hard time and trying to order it as we can. So thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Mr. McMurnett, just to give you an update, we intended to do executive sessions at the outset. Our attorney is stuck in traffic somewhere, so we are rearranging times just a little bit, so we're going through consent items right now. <laughs> uh, so we'll do consent items, and hopefully one of our attorney shows up before we actually have to enter into the session. We'll see how that goes, but we're kind of being flexible right now. Okay, city manager. Item 4D, consider resolution authorizing an amendment to the contract number 19-058 with John Ray Associates LP for the design service for improvements to Armstrong Park to include additional services for construction administration with an estimated expenditure of $16,500. John Ray Associates have been involved in the concept and design of Armstrong Park since 2019. They, cre <coughs> excuse me, they created the construction plans and associated documents for Armstrong's improvements, including the new Kidsville Splash Park. This contract amendment will allow Dunway to assure all construction administration responsibilities, assume them, uh, to ensure the project is constructed according to plan. The cost of the addendum brings Dunway's design contract to $209,500, uh, which is only a 7.45% of the construction contract approved by the council on December 20th, 2022. <clears throat> Item 4E, consider a resolution authorizing the purchase of self-contained breathing apparatus, SCBA, for Metro, from Metro Fire Apparatus Specialist Inc. through the buy board contract 603-20 for a discounted unit price bid with an estimated expenditure amount of $276,022. The fire department is requesting authorization to purchase 26 new SCBA units with 52 new bottles, 52 new face pieces, and required attachments which will allow the replacement of all current units in use. SBC SCBA has an estimated life of 10 years for frontline use. The current equipment was purchased in 2012 under the 27 NFPA standard for the SCBA. Metro Fire Operating Specialist will take possession of all current SCBA units for a trade-in, which discounts the cost of the new equipment by an additional $15,000, which is reflected in the total bid price. The actual SCBA, yeah. yes. The bottles, yes. The mask, no. He said fireman has to have fit tested his mask, so that's the reason why we're getting two of them, so that we can fit test, clean, fit test, whatever, with each individual firefighter. So yes, yeah, now. One size fits all. Item 4F, consider a resolution authorizing the purchase of a second set of 
Office of Protective PPE Turnout Gear from Casco Industries, Inc. through Buy Board Contract 603-24 discounted unit bid price with an estimated expenditure amount of $141,362. Duncanville firefighters are currently issued one set of PPE turnout gear. After returning to the fire station from the scene of a fire or hazmat incident, firefighters are unable to immediately wash contaminated gear as it would leave them without turnout gear. Uh, they, receive another, they receive another call. The continuous wearing of unclean gear creates additional exposure for them. Per NFPA 1851 standards, firefighter clothing and equipment should be clean whenever it becomes soiled or contaminated. Uh, adding an additional 45 sets of PPE PPE turnout gear will allow firefighters to be issued a second set of gear, limiting their exposure to the carcinogens and hazardous material. I have a question on the, the lifetime cycle on these is forever. I mean, there would X number of cleanings before we have to be totally replaced. I know what we're doing here and why. Yeah, this gets very the existing stuff. Is it going to eventually be obsolete? We have to replace that as well. It gets very complicated. Uh, the Texas Commission on Fire Protection requires that we take that gear completely out of service in 10 years. Uh, but the problem is, uh, as we use the equipment, wash it, dry it, uh, it can deteriorate even further. So at points, there's time where we may have to replace it in six or seven years. So that's the, another reason for the additional gear. So if a set of gear goes out of service, then they have another set of gear to get in while they're waiting for another set of gear to be ordered. With a remember that each set of this gear is custom fitted to every one of these firefighters. Uh, and that's to give them the ability, you know, to keep skin from being exposed, the ability to get down on the ground and move around, flexibility uh, while they're out uh, working. So each gear is very customized. So do you have internal processes in place to systematically evaluate each piece of equipment? some rotating basis to see what his condition is? Yes, sir. The state requires us to go in there, and they run three tests on that every single solitary year. And after every fire that we go into, they take that gear, as we mentioned here, and they wash that gear to get all the carcinogens and off-gassing from uh, fire product, product production in there to uh, get that cleaned out. That's the, the purpose of why to have the gear so that they have gear to get into while that's being cleaned. So under the, go ahead. Oh, so I was just gonna add on to what the chief said because we did the same thing in my department. And I suppose that we got SCBAs in the second set of gear, but the, the main thing, it's a na national, actually worldwide push to prevent cancer. So you don't want to wear that stuff after you've cleaned up, put it back on again, want to have it decontaminated, serviced again, inspected, make sure it's fit for duty while they can still get back in service with a, a safe set of gear. So just a little information. And some of the areas on the collars on these coats, uh, they <coughs> absorb a lot of this carcinogens. And one of the most exorbitant areas on your body is your neck, your groin, and your hands. So you got to keep that stuff clean. And, you know, we'll pull down our hoods and it gets down around our neck. So you don't want all those contaminants around on your neck, especially because that's that most exorbitant because that's going to enter your body and and uh, through that area and through your groin and like I say through your hand. That's why we really encourage our guys to when they get back, they have to shower, they have to use uh, uh, towelettes at the fire scene to get it cleaned up, try to get all those contaminants off their skin. Okay. Um, change the tax just a little bit in terms of budgeting for this. If Fire replacement is 10 years, but we're looking at, in actuality, it's six to seven. Then in your budget process, do you accrue in a sinking fund somewhere or accrual fund that early <coughs> procurement of these items so that we're not looking at 10 years so that as, you know, when the expenditure comes up, we've got it because it's already been budgeted for ahead of time in terms of life cycle economy. That is correct. We are way ahead of uh, Mayor. We budget for that stuff. We keep track records of when these guys buy their gear, when it's supposed to expire, and then as they wash them, they're supposed to keep records of that, and the, the captain's supposed to help inspect that equipment to make sure there's no tears, and it's not, um, you know, breaking down. And then every year we send that uh, gear off to be cleaned, and we have it, they do three tests 
on that gear to make sure it's still functional. So that's all included in our budget to make sure that we keep up with that process. Funding wise, no, no surprises. No, no. We don't have a fire replacement fund, but it's part of when we look at our ordinary operation costs, we anticipate it as, right. as an expenditure. That's, that, that, was, that was the foundation, but somewhere we are considering the early replacement and the, well, the eventual replacement of this equipment as necessary. That's correct. And my day chief that handles that does a very good job of that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, item 4G, consider resolution of the City Council of the City of Duncanville, Texas, ordering a joint election to be held in the City of Duncanville on Saturday, May 6, 2023, for the purpose of electing council member at large for a two-year term, one councilman from District 1 for a two-year term, one councilman for District 3 for a two-year term, and one council member from District 5 for a two-year term. The resolution is written in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, and is to order a joint election to be held, as mentioned, on May 6, 2023. The Vietnamese translation was completed this past weekend after the agenda was posted. The resolution provides for runoff elections on Saturday, June 10, 2023, if none is required. The resolution orders the election and provides for all statutory and home rule charm requirements for a joint uh, for to conduct of a general election of offices to be held through a contract to Dallas County elections. Uh, the contract of Dallas County elections will be posted on the next uh, regularly scheduled uh, city council meeting agenda, dependent on the various jurisdictions completing their work for the development of a contract. At such time, the staff will bring the contract to the city council for authorization. Have we had, had any success in appealing to the county for the cost? Uh, it's the our of share of it, the number of sites, because it's still way outlandish. Is there anything? To report on that. So there actually is a subcommittee, and just as Ms. Kristen Downs was a part of it now, we were supposed to have a, a meeting last Wednesday to do the ice storm and then they had to cancel it. So we are still pursuing reducing yes. the number of, of locations in the city. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And they're 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 listening to us on that issue. So it's not just we're asking for it, but they are listening to the desire for that based on the numbers. Very good. Yeah, I think the data collected in terms of number of people showing up at some of the locations was zero to one in some, some of the locations. Okay. All right, our attorney has appeared. <laughs> uh, good, glad to see you, Mr. Attorney. Uh, so we have kind of modified our schedule to take care of consent items until you were able to get here. So I think what we will do now, uh, we have gone through the consent items, we've covered any questions with those. I think at this point we'll go into executive session and to, to cover those items, and that will be able to bring us out hopefully around the six o'clock time frame. Mm -hmm. Or no, yeah, five seven minutes. o'clock time frame. Five minutes. The five minute time frame. <laughs> yeah, it should be very short. Okay, so just so that we keep everything uh, proper and legal before everybody departs, I need to read these items. Number, item number one, City Council shall convene into closed executive session pursuant to section 551.071 of the Texas Government Code. Consultation with the attorney will consider a settlement agreement with the City of Duncan versus Texas Eon Reality Incorporated cause number DC21-00095 pending in the 134th Judicial District Court in Dallas County, Texas. Item number two, City Council should convene its executive session pursuant to section 551.072 of the Texas Government Code. Consultation with the attorney to deliberate the sale, exchange, lease, or value of real property owned by the city south of Wheatland, east of Maine, and west of State Highway 67. With that reading, uh, everyone please remove, uh, be dismissed from here.
No, we're out of briefing. Mama, we're not coming back. This is a briefing. Are we coming back in here? Well, don't make me lie. I thought we were back out there. Well, we are going out there. But I, I don't know. Let me put my hand there. I thought. I got a jet lag on this uh, 5 o'clock meeting to start. We don't need her here in the back. Full advantage of those wings be long. Look at this. Oh, oh sure, stuff. Don't go mouth. Mm -hmm. Had no lunch. Couldn't get, had to get here. Had no dinner. That's why they provided that for you. Hey, everybody. Hey, Harvey, how are you doing? Pretty good. How you getting along? I'm all right. Good. You doing all right? Heck yeah.
event. He said, yeah, I need your advice, man. How are you going to get there? I said, well, I'm glad you made it. You need to go to the cabins and stuff like that. He said, that's a real cool shit. Wow, I didn't notice any in my salad. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I love it. Like, so we are. Uh, the greasier the spoon, the worse the hole. All right, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, we are still in our briefing and work session. And we're reconvening this, the timestamp on that's gonna be 606. So we are going into item number 2A. This is receiver presentation on the compensation study and turning it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, we have uh we have before you today, you each have a binder which has a copy of the PowerPoint and some of the uh, data that was provided uh, in front of you. Uh, what we have been working on uh, over the past year is an opportunity to reevaluate our organization. As we kicked off our budget, I spoke about how the theme of our budget was to focus on all things people. And all things people was to make sure that we as an organization were taking care of our most vital asset, which are our employees. And so this compensation study has, has been a long process, but a process that I think uh, is organic because it's ever-changing. And it also requires a lot of time and effort on our staff. Uh, our goals of our compensation studies are basically our routine practice and organization. The city conducts previous con compensation study in 2015 with changes implemented in 2016, although typical from a market workplace shift 
with COVID and other things, uh, other stuff happened and we weren't able to do it. We would look periodically at it, but we never had gone forth with a comprehensive. And so that's why we're doing this now. We know that the cost of living increases we've dealt with, but we really needed to make sure that we are in market. So what do we do? The compensation study it aims to evaluate the city's pay practices and determine what course of action is needed to ensure that the city is competitive in recruiting and retaining talent in the region. The city, through a procurement process, hired Evergreen Solutions LCC to facilitate this project. Uh, how are we doing this? Uh, determine if our current compensation pay matches pay plan trends and is competitive. We also reviewed our current employees pay and classification compared to municipalities in the region and we identified themes to consider for updating our city's recruitment and retention strategy. So although this is about compensation, it's the total package of what do we do and what can we do to not only recruit but to retain. Um, so in this process, we'll uh, let me inter interrupt. Uh, Mr. Harvey has a comment he'd like to make. It. Sure. Yes, Mr. Harvey, please. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to go on record as saying that uh, I'm very concerned about talking about this uh, particular item at this point uh, simply because it has budgetary implications and uh, the budgetary implications of this along with others are going to be talked about under a new council and so I believe that that new council has the right uh, to hear this information and weigh on it because in a very real sense they in the community are going to be saddled with the uh, consequences one way or the other of whatever decision is made so uh, I think it's fair for them uh, to have the benefit of this hearing. And so I want to go on record as saying, uh, I oppose it and being talked about at this particular time. I understand your concern, Mr. Harvey, and there is nothing to preclude this being given once again, because this is a briefing and presentation. There is no decisions to be made on this particular item at this time. We are getting our first look really at some of the inputs and the understandings of the compensation study itself. Understanding we have individuals here tonight that are deeply concerned as it affects them personally. Uh, but they need to understand as well as the rest of council that there are no decisions to be made tonight. This is simply the initial first step in our understanding as a council and as our staff and our firefighters and police officers and first responders in total and how we have gone about this in particular time. I accept your, your concern, sir. Uh, if there's any deeper concern, anybody else wants to object to this, uh, I will take that comment at this point. Thank you for your input, uh, Mr. Harvey. Uh, you may proceed. Um, to go over um, what the methodology is of how we collected this information and what we were hoping to um, get out of the process. So. Um, what goes into the process for a comp study, we do outreach, we do orientation sessions with employees, we, get, um, we have focus groups, we try to get their feedback, um, we collect the data from um, what we currently have, we collect, um, every employee did what was called a job assessment tool, which pretty much they went through everything that they did and all their tasks so we can value the position. Um, we developed classification recommendations based on that information and best practices. Um, we went out to the market to assess, you know, the pay competitiveness compared to uh, market peers and um, sister cities and benchmark positions. Um, and then um, we provide recommended compensation based on um, internal and external equity. Um, the outputs of this, so we did seven employee focus group sessions. We met with um, the different supervisor, we had 10 supervisor group sessions. The city management was interviewed through this. 41% um, of our employees participated in the surveys. Um, out of this, we were um, wanted to get a performance measurement system created as well, reevaluating our performance evaluation process. And then we had um, all staff meetings conducted after we had gotten all the information from the consultant. And um, we did multiple reviews of the information. So short term um, outcomes is um, to have an updated compensation and classification schedule with uh, new grades. Um, city uh, lo looking at our salary and benefits, having a competitive package, um, 
Employees that require an adjusted uh, classification title and salary are affected or identified in the study. Um, wanted to have career paths and development opportunities, building blocks, if you will, within um, positions to be able to move up um, and then um, identify funding um, to uh, make this happen. On a long-term basis, um, the goal obviously is to have in continued employee satisfaction and retention increased, um, strategic initiatives that are aligned with our mission and our vision, and uh, make this place a great place to work. Um, so just a, um, information, you know, looking at the, the last time we did a compensation study was back in 2015, 2016. Um, so what we looked at, we wanted to see what has been the inflationary uh, trend since the last time we did this. It's important to keep it in mind, as we all know, um, how inflation has um, been going up. So in 2015, last time we did a study, the cost of the dollar now costs you $1.25. Um, as you can see there on the on the, the right hand side, the percentages of inflation, and the reason why that uh, this is important is that you know, as everything else, cost of goods, cost of services rise, salaries rise as well. To to keep in line with um, the market. Okay. So as we mentioned, this has been a long process. We talked about this last January as far as kicking this out and a activity. Uh, annually, we conduct an internal salary survey. And that survey just asked our peers, what are you doing uh, salary-wise? Uh, as I presented to council last year, one of the objectives was to actually do a full compensation study. Uh, we kicked this off in March of 2022 with the RFP being relieved, only one proposal. 42 firms viewed it, but only one proposed. Uh, this is something that most cities are trying to do, but it's a very time-consuming activity, and so a lot of vendors are not interested in uh, taken on these tasks. In May 2022, the compensation study was reviewed by the evaluation team and we awarded the contract RFP 2020-014. In June 22, we actually kicked off this process with all staff meetings with employees defining our process and why we're going to do the internal focus groups were held with employees. There was also a document called a job analysis tool. We had a 41% participation. This was a chance for people to talk about not only what does your job say you do, but what do you do? It was a chance for them to share their experiences with the consultant. In August 22, we received our first response. Now, what I will say to you is as you get into the budget year, one of the challenges you have is that we were doing a compensation study the same time as many of our peers. And so as we look at our data, we found that the data is a constant moving, moving target. Uh, for example, our sister city next door in DeSoto just completed theirs, and they're still in the implementation phase of it. Uh, we began internal review of the results, uh, and some of the data we found was inconsistent uh, data identified. When you take something from that time frame, what you find is it's a point in time. Many individuals were approving their budget, and so they tried to estimate what the numbers would look like. Uh, so what's gone on from that is we've gone back and asked for more data. We've shared that information. Uh, following the meeting with Evergreen, we asked for some more data, specifically with police and fire, because we noticed that the information was not consistent with the information that we had received or had shared. Uh, we then started doing some of the stuff ourselves. We actually looked for, uh, with our sister cities to get their compensation plans because with the new fiscal year starting on October 1st, many individuals implemented new plans and so it makes that data irrelevant. And so, like I said, it's an ongoing target. Uh, we sent, uh, November 23, we sent three performance measurements as a guide for police, fire, and general government and the city implemented the plan to determine how this will work in the future as far as merit-based pay. An all-staff meeting was held uh, in November. That meeting was because many people were like, where is this plan? And we're getting a little concerned that they were not going to see any results of it. And so in that all-staff meeting, uh, we shared with them the timeline, what we were doing. Uh, we also shared them some preliminary observations from the data. Uh, from that, in December, uh, a linked copy of the raw data was sent to all staff and an updated file was created. Uh, I will say to that, we also held focus meetings with different groups of individuals to go over the data and kind of uh, as we started to develop it, I did not want to bring anything to council that we had not run by staff. And so staff had the opportunity uh, at a number of occasions to share their concerns. And so as they saw the data, some would bring us information that may have been different. And so we can honestly say that we have met with 
uh, every team in our city, uh, all police, fire, public works, parks, rec, every staff had an opportunity to come by and anyone wanted to follow up on additional information were able to meet with Jennifer and myself. Uh, as part of this process and as part of the overall communication process, I'm conducting one-on-one -on -one meetings with every member of our city staff uh, for 15 minutes. And so we have been doing that uh, on a regular basis for the past few months and will continue until I've met with every member of the staff. And part of that is also to understand not only who they are, what they do, but also to get some idea and gauge basically what they need and out of our organization and what things we can do to retain them. So the comparison studies that we use in this Mayor, study. I'm, I'd, I'd like to ask a question about the last slide, sorry. The, on the job analysis tool that had a 41% participation, uh, was that open to everybody and we only had 41% participate? Is that, okay. Yes. Okay. It's a, it's, it's sometimes it's one of those where they have to fill in and fill information. We send out reminders saying, come on, can we get people to do it? But just sometimes people just, for whatever reason, may choose not to fill out the form. Okay, I just wanted a clarification, thank you. Um, our comparison studies that we, uh, we used during the study, as you can see here, um, of course our best Southwest cities, Lancaster, Cedar Hill, DeSoto, um, we used Glen Heights, Waxahachie, um, Grapevine, Midlothian, Mansfield, Allen, Louisville, Hearst, Irving, Euless, Carlton, McKinney, Grand Prairie, Bedford, North Richland Hills, and Arlington. Um, based on some feedback from fire specifically, um, we looked at, um, we added Hearst, Euless, and Bedford into the equation post um, the study because they are a, um, very similar to us in our best Southwest city arrangement. There are three city that share resources and um, uh, when, they, when they go out for calls, for example, and dispatch, um, they're very similar to kind of how we're organized. So we wanted to include them in the, in the comparison cities. And I think uh, the city identified early on, so we have comparison cities that were selected and Jennifer can talk some more about it. But I think uh, there was a point in time where the council and staff identified what cities we would use as comparison. And would you explain how those cities were selected or do you know? And so, you know, we, we, do, we do try to get the feedback, you know, of course, what from council, from staff, from um, city management about what cities are best to, I mean, because there's obviously very many cities around the DFW Metroplex and we can compare it to any one of them, but these were um, chosen for um, their proximity, for, um, you know, who we, you know, have retention losing people to, for example, those that are close by and those that are of similar size. It's a big mix. Yeah, before moving on, Mr. Harvey, please. Yes. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, <coughs> these cities that we're, we compared ourselves to, you, you mentioned that um, we lose firefighters to them and so I'm looking at Grand Prairie, I'm looking at Allen. Go back. Yes, the same list. Um, Grand Prairie and Allen, Carrollton, um, those are cities that are at least 180,000. So I'd really be interested in hearing more about the criterion in which these cities got selected. I, I am hard pressed based on what I know about governmental finance to see similarities between Duncanville, Allen, even Louisville. I mean, Louisville's a hundred and something thousand people. Grand Prairie and Arlington. I was in Arlington today. They have a cheesecake factory. So I'm hard pressed to see how they compare with us. So I, I, I'm glad we're talking about this now because I have, I'm sure I have more questions. So that's what the next slide actually talks about, how we came uh, just a little bit about each city. Uh, as we talked to staff, one of the conversations and even bringing reality to our internal staff is that if you look at the budgets, we don't have the budgets. And I'll let Jennifer kind of talk through 
what we did and we put not only the population of the cities but the general fund budget and uh, so. so I had this idea of a different way to look at this when we choose cities because not every city you know it's not truly going to be apples to apples um, but um, we can get hung up on population yes they're bigger than us or we can you know think about oh they have a lot more money than us so they can afford to pay more or do more but maybe a different way to you know do a spin on it I thought well let's just take their general fund budget as that's typically uh, the most of your employees are paid for out of general fund um, monies and then take the population and kind of what would that look like per capita and this will give you kind of a different perspective of how we may rank compared to those cities based on how much general fund money do they have as, a, as they spread out um, over the population that they serve. So, you know, yes, Arlington is almost 400,000 folks, you know, population, and they have a $296, you know, million dollar budget. But, you know, in terms of spreading that resource out per capita, they're actually lower than we are in um, Duncanville in terms of... Um, the resources they may have per per population. So, so given 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 the number of cities in this survey, how many of them rank above Duncanville, and how many of them rank below Duncanville? In terms of in terms of this comparison, are you talking budget or population, sir? Um, I'm talking, talking about go back. All of these cities are included. That, yes, okay. in this slide here. Okay, so these, those cities on that other slide are part of the comparison. Mm -hmm. This so, is the same repeated in a different fashion. All right, so how many of those cities then are above Duncanville and how many of them are, are below? In terms of pay? In, or in terms of how, how they measure up. So. Well, what's the measurement? You're I'm not clear on your question either. So no, are I'm you, is the is the comparison by population by general fund or there as this is the last column is general fund per capita. What's where's the ranking that you would Yeah, what well, so that that's my question. So So there's still thirteen cities. They're, they're, these are all the same cities that were on the other page? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just again a different way to look at it. Obviously farmers branch is very similar in size, but you know they obviously have a lot more resources um, at their disposal, as you can see. Um, May I ask you a question? That sure. Kind of tax on what Mr. Harv is asking. There are probably <coughs> numerous statistical evaluations in terms of ranking. Then I would ask, how was the general fund per capita chosen as the sole identifier for ranking of all the cities? not the budget itself and not the population. Did we get consultation? Did we get professional consultation on that? How was, how was this particular last column chosen as the statistical uh, average median? Now, this was not chosen in terms of what cities we chose. This came later, you know, as we had a, had a list of cities that were part of the study. And to know that this conversation um, it was my idea to come up with a, way, a different way to look at it. So this was not a part of the reasoning when they were initially chosen, I should say. So it was, it was your judgment call to create this particular data in terms of the ranking. Yeah, we were, I, I was struggling because part of as much as I, I agree with Mr. Harvey, I know that we have limited resources here and we've had a traditional list of cities that we've used for comparison that sometimes we look at them as apples and oranges. And so in order to better understand those apples and oranges, we looked and, and Jennifer came up with, and we ran it by a couple of folks, another way of looking at us uh, in a different light. And that is why we did it now. Uh, part of even in a calculation standpoint, we talked about when you start to figure out what the average is, do you take the top one off, do you take the lowest off, which would be Glen Heights, and do you take Farmers Branch? Well, Farmers Branch population-wise is the same in us, and so I've asked, because normally we just talk about population. I think that it goes beyond population because if you look <coughs> at the budgets, the budgets don't necessarily reflect the population. And so as we look at the data, I think it's important that we know that there are some cities we don't, even if you ranked, if I sorted this today and said, who has the lowest general fund budget, and I've said that to staff, uh, we are the second lowest. 
And that's something we have to take in consideration. But from a population standpoint, we are not the lowest in population. And so it tells us that we've got our work ahead of us. Uh, but when you looked at the cities and when it was explained to me why we had uh, the comparative cities is that there were cities that were asked to be added like Farmers Branch and some others. Uh, they don't have, they have more resources. But we are in this Metroplex and haven't been free in the Metroplex. Uh, I told staff from the very beginning, I can't recommend anything that we can't afford or sustain. I can't compete with Allen. I will never tell you we can. But I also want you to have an idea of what we're competing with when our 10 employees that we've lost in police go, where are they? And so our goal right now is to give an idea for council and ourselves so we'll at least know. Uh, I'm not trying to compete with the Joneses. I just want to make sure that we are aware and that we can do what we can do as an organization. So. And, and I'm, I'm glad as well simply because I, I again repeat, I went to Arlington today and Arlington has this huge commercial base. We're a bedroom community. Have been, are now, will always be. And so a better comparison, in my opinion, is with the cities around us and other bedroom communities because at the end of the day, we have people that we serve and they have lives that they're trying to live as well and we are limited. That's the truth. We are limited. Thank you. Can I just say one thing and I'll, I'm gonna make sure that I send out, I'm cleaning up the data to you. What we're gonna find is sometimes our bigger cities actually take our numbers down because where, for example, when we say an inspector, we may have one inspector and the salary's here. They may have five and the salary's here. And so, in fact, the big cities in some cases skew our numbers because their numbers are based on having multiple people in these roles. And, and when we start to see the data and analyze it, we find that, uh, I'll use Grand Prairie as an example, uh, their numbers are sometimes lower than our numbers as far as salary, but it's because of the magnitude of the people they have. And so there's a lot of factors as we go through data. And we'll, we'll go through the data with you, uh, but we're, we're not, there's no perfect science to this. Uh, it is not something that I take lightly and not something that if I didn't feel we needed to at least have the information, we would not be doing this. But. Uh, Mr. Contreras, sir. <coughs> well, I do agree with um, something you just said uh, towards the end of your statement. Um, I, I still have the feeling that when we're dealing with um, producing numbers uh, with the specific intent of trying to see what we can do comparatively to uh, retain, in particular, civil service. Because civil service, when they leave, I think is a large part that gets drawn <coughs> by great salary differences between our city and other cities. That's, that's one thing. When you look at our, our non-civil service employees, they leave for very different reasons. Some of them do leave for money and opportunities. That's what we all work for. But a lot of them leave for other reasons. So <coughs> using one chart that is giving us an idea of what we're up against with some of the cities that we know that are attractive to our police and fire is one conversation. The civil, the non-civil service side is a whole different conversation, but we're using the same statistics to do that in the same cities. And that's where I'm uncomfortable with the choice of cities because when you average this out, and by the way, <coughs> when you're looking at an inspector from Dallas or Arlington, you're looking at an inspector that does one trade. He does only plumbing inspections, only electrical inspections. When you got an inspector in Duncanville or Cedar Hill or DeSoto, they're multi-inspectors. They're inspecting many. So you can't compare the salaries because they do distinctly different things. Um, but the last thing I'll say about this is that <coughs> when we look at, when we put these numbers out, which it's fair, it's fair to show uh, everyone, uh, police, fire, and our own <coughs> Uh, non-civil service employees, it's fair to show them what's going on out there. They used to do it 25 years ago when I was an employee. They would seem to be regularly every three or four years we'd do a salary survey. The expectation then becomes of the employees when they see this, if these numbers aren't really act 
if the numbers aren't accurate to the point that <coughs> Mr. Harvey has been pointing out and that we're looking at an Allen salary and we're looking at a Grand Prairie, I mean, we're looking at cities, they're so big they have six and seven high schools. And you know that's how we judge cities now, Mansfield. Um, their level to pay non-civil service employees is so much higher than us. We can't be cluttering this up by having them as a part of our average here because that's not the reality of what we have here. We have people here in Duncanville that we can only pay at a certain level uh, as a civil service, em as a non-civil service employee. Um, we should be looking at, when we compare, we should be looking at DeSoto, Lancaster, Euless. I would take Euless, I'd take Bedford. But when we make the big leap to these, these uh, cities, such as Allen, uh, I'll even say Grand Prairie, Louisville. We're really, we're given numbers that don't, don't apply to us on the non-civil service side. So with that, I think we have, this has to be talked about in two conversations whenever we get to that point. I know it's a presentation tonight, but that would be my suggestion is we have two conversations when we get to that point because we're dealing with different, we're dealing with retention versus um, people just leaving to move over to the next city, um, non-civil service people, so that's all. Thank you. I, I would just add that, Council, we need to remember that we are looking at raw information at this point. This is the first blush that we've had the opportunity to take a look at, and in understanding what uh, Ms. Odie and Ms. Farrell Benavides have done, I don't know how many more, so we are on page 19, and we've got, Here we go up to page 47 to go which means to me that there's a lot more information yet to come that we have not even seen yet and we're going in we're diving underground and get, getting a little deep in the weeds at this point so I'd like to allow them to continue we can ask questions as we go but with an understanding that it's a very complex process and that's why I had concern about where did this last column come from there are so many different variables that could be assessed to determine what should that comparison be. Maybe between now and page 47, there's another comparison. I don't know. But allow this to go, and let's take a look at this, and I think it's going to be fair to say that by the time we get done with this, with Mr. Harvey's input, with Mr. Contreras' input, and probably with all council's input, sending some emails to the city manager in Ms. Odie, that there could be some other variables that could be included as well the next time we look at this. And going back to Mr. Harvey's comment, the next time we look at this may likely be a whole different council that is here. Have to give that, give that consideration. So let's go ahead and just okay. with that understanding, and I do agree, you know, let's put it this way. We do know that the city of DeSoto based their salaries on the city of Allen. And it was so far outside the ability of us to meet. It is so far out the ability of any best Southwest city to meet, but that's what they did. Are we going to then say that because DeSoto did what they did, are we going to do the same? And the answer is we can't possibly do that to be judicious in the use of the funds that we have in our city. We're going to do the very best we possibly can. And at some point, that's going to be coming to us as a council to make that decision to the very best use of every single dollar we can for our first responders. And we will be very cognizant of that fact and do our best to be very, very diligent about that as well. I would be negligent as a city manager to say it's not all about police and fire. I love police and fire, but I got people who turn the water on for everybody. I got people who answer the phone. I got people who go and do inspections. And, and, th and this is not as much as I, I want to make sure that we're dealing with my civil service folks. Uh, this is to give you an update of what's happening in our city. And we are losing people, and yes, it may not all be about money, but it is something that in this society, in the Great Recession, that we're having a hard time not only recruiting and retaining people, but we're also having to focus on it. And so what I will say to you in putting, I should have started with this in mind, is what we have come up with is a compensation classification schedule for both the city staff and police and fire in two parts. Uh, the numbers that we talk about, many of those cities' numbers aren't even included. Yes, we see the high numbers, but I'm not trying to meet the averages in some cases. I'm trying to meet what makes sense. I will say to you, there are cities that aren't included in here. Midlothian, Mansfield, Red Oak. 
their numbers are up there and there's no way that we're going to get around no matter what city I put up here that our salary numbers are going to be difficult for us and so there's some tough decisions that we have to make but we're not going to try to recommend anything this city is not financially able to sustain and so what we're looking at is making sure that presenting this information is education. The next step in this process is we've put together a compensation plan which each of you've received. Uh, it's not trying to meet the average. It's not trying to meet the others. It's trying to meet what we can do. And so I'll go through this and kind of speed through it because I do know we have other parts. Uh, as we said, as our best Southwest cities, if we look at the number of employees we have, uh, we're at 290, 317, 320, 372. I will tell you, and I know that there are some people here who are hearing you and understand what you're saying, but what I've been told in my one-on-ones and my meetings with staff is that, yes, we're not Grand Prairie. We're two stations. But if you look at our call volume, you're going to find that we function at a higher level, just like we talked about when he said our inspectors. We have an inspector. They don't just inspect plumbing. They're doing plumbing, electrical, and all of that. And so part of that is understanding, and we look at each person, and we have looked at each person individually because there are not necessarily complete apples and apples to compare our staff to. There are some anomalies that we have that other cities will not have where people are, as we've always said, lean and mean. Uh, it's mean because some of our people are doing double and triple duty in some of their roles. Moving on, uh, one of the things that I focused on when I talked to you last year was looking at titles and salaries. That was something I was very concerned about because we would name people and the naming conventions didn't make sense. And someone talks about the hierarchy of leadership. Uh, at the top, you've got a city manager, assistant city manager. We use the term managing directors. Those are folks who are overseeing functions and other departments and executive directors. Then we have our directors, our chief. Uh, an administrator is someone, uh, we were using the word director and it's not really a department if it's only one person. And so we've looked at how do we adjust and make sure our titles are consistent with what they do. And so if you are over a, a department of one, you're an administrator. If you are a director, you're over actually what is defined as a department, and an administrator would be an office. Uh, chiefs, which are our police chiefs. We've also used other words like officers and, and as we've used administrators, like you see now that we have a chief procurement officer or a chief information officer. Uh, if you look at our, our finance or our HR department, our HR department consists of three people. Uh, three people, our IT department consists of four people. And so we're starting to figure out what we need to do and looking at how do we right size our city for what we need. Then we have superintendents and managers. Uh, feedback. Uh, that we received from staff of what are they looking at. They're looking at things, and, and this came from all of the surveys. Some talked about take-home vehicles. Uh, monthly allowance should increase for the phones to 100. These are just examples. Now, none of these things are, are currently being, but these are the things as we develop our budget cycle this year that we'll take into consideration. Child care, partnering with organizations. As we've heard the word updated service credit, accused, accrued sick leave payout to all employees who retire from the city. Uh, right now, police and fire get sick leave paid out up to a certain amount, but other staff are not. Uh, look at our certification pay. Are we up to speed and in line with other cities for certification uh, and reevaluating those rates? Compensation time in lieu of overtime. What other things we can do there? Hazard pay for when we're called in on ice storms and things like that. Mileage reimbursement available to all employees. There are employees who are coming in and they're driving around the city, and, and we have a policy currently in the city we reimburse for mileage. But most people are driving around their cars and don't have the energy or don't actually submit them. And so they're looking at how do we handle those. Performance stipends, sign-on referral bonuses for hard-to-fill positions. Uh, another benefit is spousal insurance, availability regardless of status. We stopped allowing employees whose spouses had insurance to be on our insurance policy. It's a simple thing. They pay for the insurance, but we stop that. And so these are some of the things that people are struggling with. Additional holiday, they said, tuition assisted, flexible alternative schedules, and work from home eligibility for positions. All of these are things that you see in other organizations that they brought out. Other things is talking about our facilities. We all know we need to do some upgrades. Additional space for exi existing facilities to store item. Uh, access to city-owned facilities. Someone talked about can staff go work out after hours. 
Then they talked about assignment pay, revisit, and this is public safety, revisit field training officer pay, on-call pay, revisit certification, shift differential, background and recruitment help, potentially additional filling, uh, and then back to hazard pay. And so this was some of the stuff that was public safety specific. Executive team still talked about it, you know, when it's take home vehicles, maybe monthly allowances, structured monthly vehicle allowance to some extent employer based on the roles those folks are having to drive in, uh, executive employee leave, and then same thing with the tuition reimbursement. So who are we as an organization? So this is our current employment statistics currently. So um, currently the head count, that includes full-time and part-time people, um, is 324. Our ratio is about 30% female, 70% male. Um, our average tenure for the full-time only um, is about eight years, and the average age is 42. Um, so you can see there in the pie chart uh, kind of how we break down. So 44% of our employee population fall in the general employee category. Um, about a uh, quarter of that is part-time, and then the rest, of course, is police and fire. Just some statistics on our vacancies and um, filled uh, positions right now. So our full-time equivalent, that is taking into consideration full-time employees as well as part-time um, employees. Um, our authorized FTE count um, is 320, and so we have 11% vacancy um, rate currently. Um, when you just look at full-time positions only, 287 are authorized, and we have 250 filled. So um, that's 13% vacancy. Um, out of those vacancies, currently nine police officers, um, three firefighters, and 25 general employees, and out of the 25, 14 are maintenance-related. So just kind of giving you um, a glimpse of, of how we compare salary-wise. Um, this just basically takes all those um, comparisons and does an average. So you can see what the average starting pay is, the mid and the maximum, and how many um, cities we got a response from. Um, of course, this is not every single uh, position that we have in the city, but gives you a good overview of about um, how we compare overall. So overall, about 5% um, starting, we are um, below that um, average. Um, in the market so so um, we came up with um, a, a two-part approach to what we would um, ideally like to um, see out of this compensation study um, so for the first phase um, that we uh, propose so we have all full-time employees um, we um, in the study they gave a variety of options of what uh, what adjustments you know they recommend um, we chose what's called a class parity adjustment and so what that means it's you know they're in a in a certain range and the range is upgraded um, that they are placed within that range based on how long they've served in that position so if they've served for one year in that position they'd be placed you know one year in that new range if they've served 15 years you know it would calculate um, 15 years worth so um, this this uh, class parity adjustment would affect 75 out of 141 um, uh, general employees filled positions. Um, that average adjustment comes to about 4,000. Non public uh, safety. Yeah, this is not public safety. This is just general, um, which is about a 7.9 percent increase again overall average. And then the, the average pay plan range adjustment, moving the pay the pay ranges is about 15. 0.3% overall. Not every single range will see a dramatic adjustment for sure, um, but that's about what the average is. And so when it says 75 out of 141, that basically means that uh, many of our positions are where they should be, and that's what the study resulted in. And the class parity actually takes it up higher because we do have long tenures, so it moves them up. And so our initial analysis of it was looking at it just to get them in grade, and that cut it to just about half. And so it was only about 40 people who were completely not in that line. And I will say that many of those who were there are many of our lower level skilled worker individuals who just haven't caught up with where we should be market wise. And then um, a phase two approach would be um, give a 2% COLA um, on top of that and then also bring part time employees that are not at $15 minimum to bring them to a $15 minimum. And this just gives you an example, but you do have the, the pay plans um, already, but just um, how some of the positions will, would be moved if the uh, pay plan were to be approved. So, so currently a librarian, for example, starts in at 50, 
thousand. Um, the recommended new range would start them at fifty three. For a water wastewater maintenance position, currently our pay plan starts them at thirty two. The recommended would put them at thirty seven as a starting pay, and that's a position specifically that's been hard to fill. And this is just an example of what the pay, pay plan would look like. Uh, as we said, all positions aren't necessarily changed. It also not only looked at what our current pay plan is, but it also looked at are the pay people in the right section. So we looked at where do you combine things. So for example, administrative assistants. We wanted to make sure they were all in those same bands. And so you actually have copies of this. And so uh, our pay schedule is currently like this for non-exempt employees. We have a range from N1 to N, not 10, and it goes up. What we looked at was, are our folks in the right bands? In many cases, decisions would be made, not necessarily based on that, but it would be based on, well, this person has a higher salary coming in and in place. We're not looking at what the person, we're looking at the position. We look at other compensation plans to see how they rank them and how they grouped individuals. And so that was the decision sorry, based on that. So we did not do this salary based. We did this based on where these positions based on descriptions would fall. The second part is what we call our management and professional general exempt employees. These are individuals that are in the exempt schedule. Uh, Department of Labor defines what can be classified as exempt. These are folks who do not earn overtime. Uh, same scenario here. We looked at it from top to bottom. What's unique that we focus on this time is we're trying to create a progression. Uh, if anyone's been in the federal government, you'll notice that they'll have a GS1, GS2, or they'll have an accounting one or a two, three. We're trying to create progression so that with our employees who stay for a while, they can say, hey, I started out as an accounting one. I worked through that. I moved up to the accounting two, and that's something that we haven't seen happen in accounting three. Now, these aren't necessarily field positions, but it gives us a, a level of it and a definition of it and, and looking at it along that. And so that was one of our goals of this. Uh, and as you can look, uh, it goes through each of the positions that currently exist and looking at it. Same thing scenario there, the word, as we talked about wording, uh, making sure there were consistent wording that's being used. And last but not least is our executive. Now this one's a little more complicated because as we looked at cities, uh, one of the trends that cities have moved to is they don't grade their executive staff. I'm not a fan of that because I like to have some barriers. And so when we started talking, uh, Lancaster, our neighboring city, uh, if you're at this level in Lancaster, you're not graded. It's based on market. So what it means is everyone's hired based on the market rate. And that can get a little bit complicated. And I personally, and in fact, I think they rep recommended not grading it. I'm just not at a point where I'm comfortable with not having bands. Uh, I did recommend I'm not graded and also adding the assistant city manager to that list. Uh, but as you can see, it still falls in the same order of what are the positions we have in that executive plan. And it's something for council to think about. And I'm also willing to find out, and I think we may have the information. And so what would happen when we were doing salary surveys, we weren't getting bans for folks. Basically what we would get is their actuals. Uh, and the actuals, and I think DeSoto and Cedar Hill, uh, Yes, we're the only one in the best southwest that grades. Um, and so it's just to me a little bit complicated, but we wanted to give you that data. Uh, so how did we compare on a, I think was Chief going to talk about this, Chief Brown? Sorry. All right, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. What we wanted to do was just um, separate salaries for uh, public safety and this is primarily what you just uh, saw with our uh, general employees if you look to the the left um, column that's just the classification that's the position as uh, you move to your right um, you're going to see the minimum average salary of the survey cities and those uh, numbers there those dollars amounts would be the amount that is the average and then the percentage is the difference between what we currently pay and what the average is. And then we have the average of the, uh, the midpoint as well as the average of the maximum salary of our uh, survey city. The t if you look at the bottom of this um, particular slide where it says firefighter, the 25% percentile is simply saying that 
25% uh, is the 81635 so 25% of the salaries that are listed are below that particular amount. 50% of the salaries that are listed in this survey are below the 50% percentile, and 75% are below the 89,000 mark there, and that's the same for police. And then this is basically the same as you've just heard from our city manager. There's a two uh, phase implementation plan. What we would like to do is adjust the salaries to three, um, I'm sorry, just uh, steps to three to 5%, effective March 1st, 2023. And then the second phase is adjust the steps to the average of what you just saw in our survey. Something I wanted to point out when it comes to the public safety, um, when we had conversations with police and fire, is that we wanted to focus on the ending pay. We tend to get focused on the starting pay um, for recruitment, but you know, the reality is, you know, when they're looking for a job, um, starting pay is important, but you know, they're just trying to get in. Um, but so the retention piece of it is what, um, really important to focus on the ending pay. So our strategy was to, um, yeah, sorry, yeah. our strategy was to uh, focus on um, moving up that ending pay. I'm gonna step back to yeah. the uh, sheet just so you'll see. We did, at the bottom, you can see our best Southwest city. Uh, as you can see with Duncanville, uh, we are, uh, in fire, from our starting pay for firefighters at our current salary, we're right even with Lancaster, a little bit below Cedar Hill, uh, above Grand Heights. One of the activities we did, which I think Mr. Harvey probably would agree with too, is we did a couple of them. We took off the highest and we took off the lowest, and it didn't really impact it. Uh, but you'll notice in some of the data, and I, I think it's important to highlight where at 63, you'll see there's, it's all over the gamut. I mean, it's not necessarily, there's not a consistent answer to it. And I say that to say, if you look at the starting pay for an Arlington firefighter, it's at 66. And so that's why I said some of the uh, smaller cities, for example, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, look, you'll be amazed at what they're doing. Irving, 64. And then you get up to some of the other places like Hearst, who is a population peer-to-peer uh, if you look at theirs, their starting is at 73. And so uh, cities do different things. Uh, there are some other cities that I could have added in here. Uh, Red Oak is one example of a city that has actually made huge strides in upgrading and updating their salary structure. Uh, the same could be said for the police officers. And as someone mentioned and asked earlier, and we talked about DeSoto, they moved to 73. That was a, a decision uh, that they made. It's not quite... Uh, at the Allen level of 83, but it's uh, much, much higher and very difficult for us. But if you look uh, at where we are at 63, uh, we are above Lancaster, above Glen Heights, but uh, we are just a couple of thousand below Cedar Hill, Bedford. And I think uh, if you look at it once again at North Richland Hills, which is a comparative city, they're at about 65. And so what you're gonna see at what we're recommending to you is yes, we recognize we want you to see the numbers. We know what the numbers are, but they do not have an impact on the recommendations we're making. They help to inform us, but our recommendations are based on looking at not only the best Southwest, but really understanding what the apples and apples are for the city. So moving to where we are with the uh, range, uh, when we talked to staff, we talked about a couple of things. One is number of steps. We know that public safety is a civil service group. And so within that, uh, public safety standpoint, what we looked at is initially is a recruitment. We need a recruitment. As we talked to staff, we found out that if we could retain our folks, we wouldn't be so concerned. And so we started to look at how we could adjust and move toward the back end to ensure, because what we have is people as a police officer, if you stay an officer, you max out, and you get to that seventh step, and same thing with fire, you're there. And if you know we have stability, unlike most cities, then there's the only increases these individuals receive are our annual cost of living. And that's why council has to readapt the civil service role. So we focused very heavily on that. Uh, looking at the others, uh, our play plan was to get us even with our local folks in Cedar Hill and staying just even. Uh, we are not proposing anything drastic uh, for the civil service plan. As we move over to the uh, police, it's very much the same scenario there. Um, 
same thing. Now, what we also were looking at is because we know on October 1st, we are going to be looking at what else can we do. And so the recommendation that I was comfortable with, we were comfortable with, is getting us to the 67. Now, what does that really mean to most of us? That means that the moment if we approve this, my neighboring cities are going to go back and they're going to all adjust their play, pay plan to 68 start. That's just where we are as an organization and a community right now. Uh, but it still is far below, as you'll see as a starting, if you go back to this page, uh, at, as a next year getting to 67, all of these individuals are in different categories. It's still not to the point where the other folks are, and so we're not recommending that uh, drastic a change. Um, so what does this look like from a cost impact? Uh, for the general employees, uh, it looks like it's about $231,626. Uh, for my civil service employees, it's about $233,064. And retirement and taxes gets you an additional $64,313, which gets you a total of $529,000. So I, I don't know if anyone remembers, but one of the things that I mentioned in the budget process is that we were planning on this in January. And so part of it is that we had money in the budget for increases, and we were looking at merit, but merits are limited on how we can do it. And so the way we we're looking at funding it from the general fund is we have $300,000 already allocated uh, available to fund portions of it. Uh, the other funds in which it would come from, general fund represents 448,000 of it. Utilities is 54,000, economic development is 11,000, sanitation is 13, and field house is 1,700. Uh, how we recommend and look at covering this, as I mentioned, is uh, with the money that is already in the budget, we also had some contingency funding and savings funding for this for this year that would cover the total cost of this. But it's not just a one time decision. We recognize when you make decisions like this, this has a next fiscal year impact. What does that impact look like? Jennifer. So um, as of October 1, assuming that um, the first phase was to be implemented in this current fiscal year, what that 24 budget impact would be as we realize the full cost. Um, so having uh, the adjustments on the general employee side, um, the 2% COLA bringing uh, part-time to $15 minimum, the adjustments to civil service uh, bringing them up to that um, that full pay plan that we showed you, the retirement and taxes, all those that get factored in there, it would be a $1.7 million um, dollar impact. And as you can see in the general, um, how it breaks down by, by fund. Can you say that one more time? So $1.5 million, um, this would be in the total impact to the 24 budget. Um, utilities, 121, economic development, 25,000, sanitation and field house, as you can see there. So uh, to give an example, as I said to staff, is we generally, I think last year, budgeted about 800000 mm -hmm. for our cost of living increase. And so you still have a, a pretty big difference to make up, which means that as we went into budget preparation, this would be a very lean budget for us this year. This would mean there would be no, and I've talked to staff about it, uh, all things people would have to continue on. And so this would encompass all. Uh, can we afford it? Yes. Is it going to mean that when we go into this budget process that we will definitely have to be very uh, methodical and, and know that uh, their surplus will not be there? Uh, generally, uh, we have about a million plus to play with and to do other things in an enhancement standpoint. Uh, we've been budgeting, as I said, about 800000 This would be in lieu of, this would include where we've normally estimated for a cost of living increase where this would come from. No, the next part is the retirement system stuff. Uh, now, with respect to the current. Th this is, uh, creates problem for Council Member Contreras since he is a recipient of those uh, as a retiree for this. So we would ask him that he would have to leave the room in this discussion. 
because he would directly benefit from this. And that's been our tradition. I think Mr. Schwartz did the same when uh, he was on council. Thank you. Well, Mr. Attorney, since this is strictly informational and no decisions are being made, is this information still necessary for Mr. Contreras to be recused from this information? Uh, he's entitled to the information, but he can't deliberate. You're asking questions, and that's deliberation under the Open Meetings Act. We'll see that he has the information available, but it's not appropriate for him to deliberate with y'all. Is it possible then for him to remain in the room, but just be given the guidance that he is not permitted to? He can watch, and the uh, can we make sure that this is being broadcast? And and the reason is so that he doesn't influence the rest of you. Correct. And put himself in that position, but he can watch on the screen in the other room. That's fine. And everybody has a copy of the binder and the information. Right. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hager says you can watch on a screen. So uh, I don't know how to make this go to that, but I can pull it up on my computer. You're entitled to the information. I just don't want you deliberating with the rest of them. Huh? So is there somewhere where you can watch the presentation? It's in your binder. I thought maybe they broadcast it in here. I don't think we I'm can. Go I'm good, because it'll be on video, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. Right, thank you. I'll be right back. I'm going to get hey, you can. You know what, Mr. Harvey? You can do whatever the hell you want. Thank you. All right, fine. Thank you very much. Okay. I just I just wanted to make sure that he has an opportunity as such. Okay. All right. Thank you. Proceed, please. Okay. TMRS retirement. Uh, we put a couple of use of this. Our Texas Municipal Retirement System is a system that we participate in. And we also uh, often are asked to tell you what all the abbreviations stand for. And so USC updated service credits. I'll let Jennifer go through that for sure. So um, as we're wrapping up our presentation here, we wanted to talk about TMRS as well um, because uh, the feedback from the employees, TMRS is definitely a topic of conversation um, for retention. Um, uh, so yeah, Texas Municipal Retirement System, um, as a part of our pension benefit, you know, the city matches that two to one. We as an employee contribute 7%, you know, the city matches that two to one. There are other components to the retirement plan that we do not currently have. The first being what's called an updated service credit. An updated service credit only affects current employees. The second thing um, is a COLA, a cost of living adjustment, which would only affect the current retiree population, those who have already retired from this city. So what updated service credits um, do? They enhance the payable pension benefit. So, um, so what TMRS does, just uh, to give you an idea of what, the, what it means, um, so they take the last three most recent years, they do a look back, and um, they average that together to determine kind of what your actual cash balance is in your pension uh, plan. And then they assume that, so if you, if you started as a, as a maintenance worker, now you're the director of public works, for example, you have obviously, um, your earning um, is much higher you know, now than it was when you first started. So the idea is that you know, they make an assumption, they do a look back, they make an assumption that you've been making that earning basically for you know, the, your duration um, in the plan. And so that's what an updated service credit does. And it comes in different uh, quantities. So you can adopt like a 50% um, or a 70% or 75% or a 100% updated service credit. Um, just to ch show you kind of what that, that cost would be. So TMRS allows the city to adopt um, updated service credits only. 
You can do it on a repeating basis, meaning where it's, go it's um, ongoing every year automatically, or you could do it at an ad hoc basis, meaning one time. Um, so just to give you an idea of what that cost would be to do an updated service credit only, um, doing 100% um, one time updated service credit would be about $282,000 impact. When you add COLAs into the mix, um, COLAs really what drive the cost of um, the added benefit. Um, the last time we had um, an ad hoc updated service credit and COLA was in 2017, 2016, around that time frame. But just gives you an idea of uh, kind of what that financial impact would be if we were to adopt um, updated service credit and or um, the COLA. Um, but as feedback from employees, you know, throughout this process, you know, they're looking at their pension. They want to retire one day, and they want to um, see the best um, benefit um, out of it. And so this next chart kind of gives you an idea, based on those cities, um, how the city of Duncanville ranks in terms of the TMR's benefit. So as you see highlighted there in the yellow at the very bottom, um, all these other cities, even including um, our sister cities, DeSoto, Lancaster, Cedar Hill, um, they receive um, the updated service credit and COLAs on a recurring basis. I think uh, what was important for us here is this is something that councils mentioned and others have brought up several times. Uh, it is a very costly endeavor, and uh, I will highlight to you that these are reoccurring increases. Mm -hmm. So if we, for example, decided that we had a windfall as a city and we were going to do 100% updated service credit and 70% COLAs, that is $3.3 million additional annually. Okay. Um, so I want to make it clear when people here and, and staff and everybody will talk about it, uh, there's a cost. Part of the cost issue is because we aren't in the reoccurring program. So it's a catch-up. And so if we were in it and stayed in it, it would be different. Uh, last year, I, I was at the budget presentation uh, with the city managers and, and one of our sisters, I think University Park or one of those, were just going into this program and they were talking about it is a huge impact. Um, what makes us unique and also wonderful is that we do have a longevity of employees. It is not unusual for someone to start and work their way up as our police chief, for example, started out as an officer and he's now the chief well his updated service credit would look at his last three years and so it has an impact uh, many of our individuals are very very interested in those uh, this is something that would not and could not take effect until January and would not be even brought back up to you but we wanted to give you this information until we got to our budget discussions uh, for this next fiscal year because as it is is that it only allows it to occur in January uh, but we know that you've had conversations and we've had Jennifer to go back and work with TMIS and get real numbers based on our current employment base. And so this is as of today. Now, this number can change. Uh, as we know, people come, people go, and people retire. And so as he said, the updated service credit only affects our current, and then the COLAs are those who are currently retired. So we've given you a lot of information. Uh, and we wanted to, and that's why we wanted to have a specific item for briefing on this. Uh, what we would like for you to do is to uh, take some time, review it. I have some more data available. Uh, we'll also work some of the numbers for you. Uh, I have been working on a sheet which has all of the cities who responded. So what I can say to you is, although you see this list of cities here, we don't have data from all those cities. Uh, many cities did not respond and have not responded because they may not have positions. But I think it's important for you, and in my mind, as an analytical counsel you are, you will want to see the raw data. And so I can take this data in any form or fashion. If there is something that you see in this long list that you would like for me to remove, I would like for you to email me directly and let me know. If there is a city that you see that you would like some more data on as far as should have been here, let me know that because we have been working on still contacting cities to try to get their most up-to-date data. 
but I will send you the information in a number of fashions and one that will just focus on best Southwest cities for you to see that information uh, that kind of led to it. And so um, I wanna thank Jennifer, Chief, I wanna thank the whole team because a lot of meetings went into this, a lot of effort went into this. Uh, this is a difficult thing to do uh, as we talked about releasing the RFP and going through this process. Uh, there's no perfect time to present it because it does take time. I can guarantee you that half the data that we had and we received was already outdated by the time we received it. And I can tell you that if I keep pushing this off, it's gonna be outdated again and it will never stop because cities are constantly doing compensation studies. And so uh, the ideal scenario for us would be to have it and to be able to roll it into our budget but the problem for me on that is, in this scenario when it comes to changes, is then I would be working with a new set of numbers that then would actually raise the bar up even higher because I know that some of the cities have already made changes and raised their salaries that aren't actually reflected in our data. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna rewind way into the middle of the presentation to make a, ask a question. In, my experience in evaluating personnel costs the salary itself is only one small piece of the salary mm -hmm. and when i take that into the accounting practice and looking at, at personnel costs it's look it's it's almost as though the the salary the base salary itself is like the gross but after you net 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 it out which means you're adding on all the benefits adding on any insurance mm -hmm. costs that the city pays this is what I call netting it out into a fully loaded personnel cost. I don't see that. I see raw salary data, but I don't see a fully loaded personnel cost. Now my question would be then, not seeing that and being only superficially knowledgeable with the TMRS, does the TMRS that we do not have impact having a fully loaded personnel cost in terms of our being a council and even you folks as staff being able to evaluate where we ought to be. Because looking at raw data simply as the personnel cost leaves out, in my experience, almost 40% of a fully loaded personnel cost. It's on this document here, retirement and taxes includes all of that on this uh, implementation number one. So of the uh, 529,000, 64,313 is the uh, benefits cost, TMRS, all of that's incorporated taxes, everything that the city pays. Okay, let me follow that on to a little more confusion then. So if we were to take this 529, what would we add that to to come up with what our total fiduciary responsibility would be in terms of our accountability for budgeting for total overall personnel? We would then add $529,000 to, to the total personnel costs, regardless of whether civil service or not, how does that come into play for coming up with a fully loaded personnel cost? This is what it looks like. This is, if we did everything we talked about, um, as we look at it next year, if we just focused on that, the impact to our overall budget is this fact. Retirement and taxes are a total cost for everybody, civil service, general, as well as part-time, represent 197,636 our computers so we were able to generate for person by person each individual we were able to go through and fully calculate what that impact would be and that would be fully loaded that's the impact mm -hmm. so that's 1.7 added on to what we pay out yes 1.7 a year so when we look at this number that would be the accountability in terms of where do we come up with $1.7 billion Absolutely. above and beyond where we are today. Absolutely. And you said we may have fund balances of around a million, so we've already exceeded that, just looking at this particular number here well, by almost 70%. Minus 800,000, so we already, so annually we've been budgeting. Well, I rounded it up to a million. Well, well no, well, okay. Yeah. So the million wouldn't be fund balance. That would be what we've used annually for our cost of living increases. So what we've done annually in the city is a cost of living, a COLA which is basically increase their salaries. And so this would be the same, but it, it goes up a little bit higher, a whole lot higher to me. But uh, this would 
uh, be absorbed if we decide to do this uh, via what we would normally have allocated for our cost of living increases for our staff and any salary changes that happen. And so, if, as I said, within our last budget cycle, we actually had 800,000 plus the 300. We had 1.2 million in salary incentives that we have sitting, that we set in our budget just for salary enhancements. 300,000 of it was for merit increases and 800,000 was for the cost of living increases that we approved for staff. And that ranged for staff between 2% and 5% cost of living increases, which, you, which we gave last year. And we've done that on an annual basis. And so that comes off of the top, that would be our baseline budget. Left over from that would means where we would normally have a million plus, we would probably be just at a million. I can't tell you right now, but we do kick off our budget. We're going to kick it off today. We're going to kick off our budget process tomorrow or next week, Jennifer. Uh, but yes, this would have to, this would ch severely change our budget. And I think that I've said to staff that if we go forward with this and if we approve something like this, then you've got to understand my budget directions are if you want an enhancement, you're going to have to tell me how you take it from within. Let me go. You just touched on something else that was rolling around the back of this noodle that I got up here, and that is the budget process itself. It never stops. Well, we, we really kick off the budget process in the June time frame so that we have an approved budget. Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're off at TMRF. So the big challenge is remembering what I was talking about, budget. and I do. The budget process. So with the budget process kicking off in earnest in June, knowing that the budget process is a continual thing, goes on year long, going back to what we're looking at here in terms of implementation dates, we're, you're showing a March 1st date here. What is the intent of staff in terms of we as council looking at doing something for a one March implementation and going back to Mr. Harvey's comment, which has great merit in terms of knowing that we are going to have possibly some council changes coming up in a May election. So is it, is it the city manager's intent for this council to approve something for a one March implementation or is this also just strictly informational for us to consider? This is the briefing. Uh, my plans are to bring this back to you at our next council meeting. Uh, because of civil service rules, uh, it would require council to approve the changes to their compensation, pay and compensation plans. And so what I would do between now and our next meeting is based on your feedback and input, uh, bring back an ordinance. Correct me. Yeah, the classification ordinance needs to be amended. Uh, and so I would bring that back to you. Um, for you to um, consider. Unless you don't want me to bring it back, I won't. Uh, but my plans are as now um, and is to bring back uh, the two-part plan. I will also bring with that plan the exact way the money's coming because uh, I don't believe you bring something without a, a way to pay for it and the way that I see us paying for it. And so I'm giving you the data. Uh, Adina and Jennifer and I have a lot of work ahead of us. We actually know that we can do it, but I also just need to reiterate that I have to say to staff is all things people means that there are little things that we like that we may have to cut out. Uh, our fiscal outlook looks good uh, for next fiscal year. Our sales tax are strong, which is one of our main sources. 
Our housing values are continu continuously uh, increasing to be strong. Uh, but once again, as we look at our general fund budget, our, fu our budgets don't look like other budgets. We don't have new, new development. But uh, I look at Gus often and say, uh, staff's depending on it. And we're depending on what we can do to improve our internal values to increase and to continuously increase our revenue input or increase the value of what we're bringing in. So another question, if I may. Hearing what you just said and knowing that we are probably going to be faced with a decision prior to the kickoff of the budget season, approving that budget, can you categorically assure us as a council and staff and city itself that if what you are proposing, this council approves, that we will have a balanced budget, meaning we can afford this? I certainly can, uh, and I have two parts to this. The, the caveat is I'm only asking for the approval of this first part. I know we can afford that. As we move to the second part, this is a budget decision. Even though I, I want to know that you want it in the budget, there's still 582,000. Uh, there's the 2% COLA that is not going to be asked right now. The part-time movement up to 115, that's 113. So there is a two-part process to this. And so because of that, uh, if we get to a point, and I will say this to staff and anyone, because no one expected COVID, that as we're going through this budget process and we don't see the numbers, phase two will not be recommended in our budget. For phase one, very comfortable with. Phase two, we gotta make sure we're watching the numbers. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harvey and then Mr. Contreras. I just wanted to repeat again that I am uh, opposed to making decisions on a budget item that the new council will not have an opportunity to weigh in on. I repeat. Mr. Contreras. Would you, um, understanding that, that some of our, our costs come out of uh, different revenue sources or different accounts, um, do we currently have uh, projects that are on hold for lack of funds or um, any issues where um, money is kept us from going forward with uh, other things other than this issue we're talking about here today? Yes. Uh, we have uh, funding shortfalls in our parks projects that we need to complete. Uh, those are my main ones that come to mind. I think we've identified the funding for the fire station, but I also have a people issue. I, I have project managers which are engineers that I don't have right now. Okay. They left. Uh, okay. Thank you. I, I would ask this then that um, before our next meeting and we have this discussion, can we be provided with some of that information so that as we have the discussion, we can see where we're lacking funds elsewhere? Absolutely. We did that presentation when we did the bond, and I will get you a copy of the presentation because we gave a uh, presentation when we did the bond conversation of all the projects, how much we needed for each project, mm -hmm. as well as recommending that we borrow. And so I'll get you an update and make sure those numbers are up to yeah. date and get that out to council. Right. But we did, uh, I believe, we did that presentation when we were doing the water rate study of all the projects that are, were facing shortfalls. Oh, the service center, that's the main one that I was trying to think of. Okay. And so I'll get you that and the numbers of where the shortfalls are. Okay, thank you. Very good. All right, no further comments, uh, questions on this. Uh, good discussion. And uh, city manager, I think you were correct in way back when you said something about we are an analytical council. <laughs> yes, we are. And we appreciate the depth of the data that has been presented to us, the hard work that's gone into this, and knowing that the compilation of such data, and as you said, it changes almost daily in terms of what other cities are trying to do. The best that we can do, and as staff and as a council, is take the data as it stands and take a snapshot and work on that data. Because looking at it and saying, is it going to be volatile? And the answer is yes, it's going to be volatile. And I think looking at the economy of the United States today, we're in the highest inflation rate in four decades. 
and how that four decades inflation rate is going to impact every single one of us in terms of our disposable income coming out of our back pocket or our purse, it needs to come into play in what we're doing here. And I see that you have included that in terms of the CPI, that 8.4 right now in terms of the inflation rate. And what the Fed is doing with, infl with interest rates in terms of trying to combat that inflation rate, how each of us are going to be affected by that, nobody knows at this point. So as time will tell, I, said, I think that we, what we need to do is understand that you're doing the very best you can with the information available at this particular moment in time. Now, are there different measures? I believe so. That's why I went back to that very first slide, Joe, to, to what you did, Ms. Odie, in terms of the, uh, that last column. I don't recall exactly what it was, but you know, it was your judgment call to use that as a, base, as a baseline of comparison. I think there are probably others. And I think what we ought to, as a council, ought to do is consider what possible other baselines or statistical baselines could be used. And is it going to be a spreadsheet this long? I hope not. Maybe it's just another two or three to evidence to us something to make us where are the apples and oranges. And, you know, when you do statistical analysis, one of the things you do is you throw out the outliers. Right. You throw out the high, you throw out the low, and you look at those that are actually workable, and what you can depend on in terms of a general population to say what the decision we're making is going to be a good decision. And what's our risk factor in that good decision? Are we going to be 100% correct? No. Are we going to be 85% correct? Maybe. Are we going to be 90% correct? Maybe so. But I think in looking at that and those statistical outliers saying, this is a jump. Take out this one, take out this one, and let's rework that average, rework that median, and I think that can be substantiated by anybody that's doing math in this place in terms of statistical analysis. Those outliers should be thrown out. And we did that. And that's an understanding that we, as under, we need to understand. Include it maybe in terms of the data compilation, but then throw us something else saying, now here it is with the outliers away. Your X2 minus X1 is by the, you know, in, in all that kind of poop. But, you know, looking at that and understanding it, I think, is something that would be very important for us in the future. Uh, Mr. Coons, yes, sir. I'm sorry, man. I, I did have one question. Yes, sir. I uh, apologize for w waiting so long. Uh, how much, if we decided to implement phase one, how much would that impact our ability to Im implement phase two later on? Um, implementing phase one uh, will not impact phase two. Uh, it just means that the phase two portion of it, if we just went completely into phase two, it would just move the whole process to the new budget cycle, which would be the 1.7. I think the, the biggest impact of that on phase two is just morale. That's the only, that's the outlier. And that's the reason this, off, this auditorium is filled with staff from all over the city. They are concerned. Very good. Thank you. All right, uh, formally, this concludes our work session and briefing session. M Mayor? Yes, sir. Uh, we had uh, had the executive session, and the way the agenda was structured it was to take any action necessary of executive session in the work session, or do you want to move it to the end of your meeting? Either way is fine. Well, actually, what I was going to do, because we've been at this for two and a half hours, is take like a five-minute break come back and actually convene city council and then we can take the executive session items and then we can move forward throughout okay so uh, is that okay with everybody mm -hmm. um, I need it so there it is <laughs> uh, please take a you know this to get back as quickly as possible if you can do it in five minutes but so recess uh, city secretary recessing at 731 thank you come back quickly
God of justice and mercy, thank you for the gift of life, the opportunity to serve the people of our city. Help us to act with character and conviction. Help us to listen with understanding and goodwill. And help us speak with charity and restraint. Give us a spirit of service. Remind us that we are stewards of your authority. Help us see the humanity and dignity of those who disagree with us and to treat all persons, no matter how weak or poor, with the reverence your creation deserves. And finally, Father, renew us with the strength of your presence and the joy of helping to build a community worthy of the human person. We ask this as your sons and daughters, confident in your goodness and love. Amen. Amen. Please join me in pledge to our flag. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Please be seated. So as was mentioned, we are somewhat out of order, but we're going to try and follow it as close as we can. I'm going to go into, <coughs> excuse me, into reports very quickly. On my mayor's report, uh, City Council Member Karen Sherry and I were privileged and honored yesterday to be able to participate in the ribbon cutting of the new emergency department at Methodist Charlton. And they will be opening eight, 70 beds. It is state of the art. I would venture to say it is the very best in the United States today in terms of what's been put into that particular facility. Uh, one question I did ask is I know that the right now the base that they can accommodate are two, two ambulances at one time. The new facility can accommodate eight ambulances at one time. And they will be open for business Monday. So it coming Monday, if unfortunately you have to use the emergency department, at Methodist Charlton, don't go to the old one, go to the new one. It's quite identifiable. Uh, secondly, just real quickly, uh, I was very privileged and honored to be able to attend the governor's inauguration on, um, what are we in? February, January 17th. Uh, the primary purpose for that was to be able to go there and honor one of our restaurants. The Pelican House, owned by Louis Rainey, was chosen as the single restaurant in the DFW Metroplex to be one of only 10 food providers for the governor's luncheon after the inauguration. So I attended that with Lewis and his, and his lovely wife, uh, Surgeon uh, Rainey, and met hundreds of people in standing in line to get Pelican House food who had never heard of the city of Duncanville. So it was quite an honor for us to be there. So thank you for that. Any other city council members reports? Uh, Mr. McBurnett, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Um, recently, the uh, Keep Duncanville Beautiful City Project, along with Keep Duncanville Beautiful, had a event at Lakeside Park where they planted uh, perennials and annuals and, and stuff, and it was a community effort that was brought together, so I want to commend them for that and, and doing something that's going to change the landscape of Duncanville. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Veracruz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a reminder that on February 25th, the Duncanville Education Foundation is going to host their Heart of Duncanville 5K run, so we'd love to see you out there. I don't know the time, but we'll see you out there. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Just a few uh, brief announcements. Tickets are on sale now for the Parks and Recreation for the Daddy-Daughter Dance, which will be Saturday, February 18th at 6 p.m. Capture special Daddy-Daughter memories with a lovely evening that introduces music, dancing, dinner, and fun, and lots of prizes. Also, I'd like to announce the Fire Department has three vacancies currently, and civil service exam was given on December 17th. 16 applicants attended. From these interviews, one candidate will proceed with this process. 
Uh, Public Works, in response to the winter weather event last night, I want to thank our Public Works team and crews who sanded bridges and intersections on our roads, our police and fire who are out on call, street division and equipment. I want to thank all of our staff for continuing to represent uh, Duncanville and our city in the highest regard. Also, uh, in our senior center on January 18, Einstein Ber uh, Bagels in Mansfield, Texas, donated over 50 uh, bagels for the center's monthly social. On Thursday, January 26, Mayor Gordon hosted his monthly coffee with the mayor. Finally, I'd like to uh, share with you uh, last uh, two weeks ago, I'm pleased that I was elected to the board of directors for the Dallas, Greater Dallas Goodwill Board. Uh, this is a good opportunity uh, to interact with some individuals. The things that Goodwill, we most think of donations, but they focus a lot on workforce and workforce development. And so I'm excited to be serving in this role uh, within as a member and the only city manager sitting on this current board with a lot of wonderful developers, businessmen that we hope to find more interest in our city of Duncanville. And that concludes my report. Thank you, city manager. And congratulations on the election. Moving on to item, uh, where are we, 2A, proclamations and presentations. I'm going to call upon our assistant, uh, Parks, and, Parks and Recreation, what do we call it, manager, director, Mr. Tyler Agee. And Mr. Agee will do the proclamations and presentations for both item A and item B. And Mr. Agee. Is this your first time before the council? <laughs> well, we're, we're an easygoing group, really. So welcome. Congratulations on your appointment to your position. We're very thankful to have you here in our city. You have a great background and a great resume. Thank and you, I'm sure that Mr. Stevenson is very happy to have you on board, as are we, staff and council. So welcome, um, Mr. Ag. Thank you, sir. Without further ado, um, thank you, Mayor, City Council. You might want to slip that mic up just a little bit. There you go. Just like this? Yep, you're good. All right. Uh, the uh, Business Beautification Award is a program implemented by the KDB Board to encourage beautification of the commercial properties here in Duncanville. To be recognized for this award, a commercial property must be in good standing with the city's code enforcement and building inspe inspections department, while also making a significant improvement to the exterior portion <clears throat> landscape and long-term maintenance of the building. This award is given out once per quarter. Um, and with that being said, uh, I would like to read the proclamation um, that will be given to uh, <clears throat> the spring 2023 award winner. Um, <clears throat> whereas the city of Duncanville is committed to improving the physical quality of the community life and whereas the Keep Duncanville Beautiful Board was established to promote this commitment and whereas the mission of the Keep Duncanville Beautiful Board is to empower Duncanville citizens and businesses to take responsibility for enhancing their community environment and whereas each quarter the Keep Duncanville Beautiful Board recognizes one commercial property within the city for significant improvements to the exterior portion of the property, landscape improvements and or long-term maintenance and property that exemplifies high quality standards and whereas Tacos Cantu, located at 106 East Highway 67, has been selected as the Business Beautification Award winner recipient for the spring 2023 um, quarter. Now, therefore, I, uh, Barry L. Gordon, Mayor of the City of Duncanville, Texas, do hereby urge all residents to join me in congratulating Tacos Cantu, located at 106 East Highway 67, and commending this business for contributing to the beautification of our city. If I could get the representatives for uh, Tacos Cantus to come up and join me, the owners, uh, Miss Juana and Leonel Cantu. And baby. <laughs> Bring baby.
goodness, he's teensy. How old is she? Wow. Wow. I would like to mention that Tacos Cantu provided breakfast for our staff during the recent ice storm. Thank you very, very much for that. Congratulations. In addition to the Business Beautification Award, uh, <clears throat> the KDB Board also uh, picks uh, Residential Curb Appeal winners. Um, <clears throat> I do ask that if any representatives for uh, the recipients of this award are here, they can come up at the end after I get done uh, uh, reading off the winners for each district. Um, these citizens are being recognized for their um, <clears throat> or being notified, or I'm sorry, the citizens are being recognized for this award have been noticed by the board for respectfully, for their responsibility to enhance their community, starting with their own front door. From District 1, we have Liz Elizabeth and Arnulio Ram Ramos, address 815 Green Hills Road from District 1. From District 2, we have Anthony Hopp at 202 Robin Hill Road. Also from D District 2, we have Nickel Benson at 247 Tim Timothy Trail. In District 3, we have Linda Young, 919 Eisenhower Drive. District 4 is Leon Herrera at 910 <coughs> Cedar Run Drive. And then we have District 5 with Jaina McBroom at 1,103 Rita Lane. Are any of those individuals present? Please come forward. And who are you? Linda Young. District 3. Yeah. Very well. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mary Ann, you want to join me Thank you for keeping our city beautiful. Um, City Attorney, I'm going to go to those executive session items now before citizen input, if we may. Okay, thank you, Mayor. As a result of the executive session that we held earlier on item one, uh, which is the matter involving Eon, there's a motion that I would like to read for, you, for the council to consider. Uh, the motion to, is to approve a settlement agreement by and between Eon Reality LLC and the City of Duncanville in the amount of $120,000 for back rent from Eon for the building now known as City Hall Annex located at 201 East Wheatland, Duncanville, Texas, and to authorize the City Manager to execute the appropriate documents. Thank you, Chair. Let a motion to approve. So moved. Second. We have a motion to approve by Councilmember McBurnett, second by Councilmember Coons. Council, please vote. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. No, there's no action as a result of the other agenda item that completes our executive session. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, moving on to citizens input. I have two cards that pertain to agenda items. I'm going to withhold those till we get there and some general comments. First one I have is uh, Mr. Homer Fincannon. Thank you. 
And I'll just remind folks that in accordance with our city rules, individuals that wish to speak during a citizen comment time are limited to two minutes. And there is a timer on the lectern there and city, and city secretary monitors the time as well. So please limit your comments to two minutes. And if you please state your name and address for the record, sir. Homer Fen Cannon, 546 Wind River Drive, Duncanville, Texas. Uh, resident since 1962, so that makes 60 some years I've been paying taxes. I did see one of those jobs, part-time jobs, in the park department. It was for if it was for fishing over at uh, uh, at your lake over there, uh, off of Cedar Ridge, back in there. I wouldn't mind applying for that job, and they could just take it off my taxes. Back when uh, my relatives came to this country, they was mercenaries fighting for. Uh, the queen, unfortunately, but we stayed in the country, and we've been here ever since. And uh, so, uh, there, even if they was away fighting uh, in another country as mercenaries, the family back home got their taxes deducted. It was one of their perks, and uh, we may need to consider that in years to come because I know my two little fair meadows homes uh, I pay out, you know, close to. Nine thousand dollars in a year, and and I know the I know the firemen and the policemen and others need it. I'm an old teamster, and I know they didn't negotiate up uh, with fine people like you. They had back rooms, with Jimmy Hoffa and some of the mafia and everybody, and they got the wages up there good. And I was a teamster. I, in fact, I shook Jimmy Hoffa's hand. I don't know what happened to him, but you know he, he's gone. <laughs> But uh, anyway, there goes my two minutes already. I yeah, haven't even got running. in the air. <laughs> hey, uh, the, uh, one of my uh, people had heard that, and they sent me a coupon for Ray's, hard, uh, Ray's Hardware and, and uh, Ammunition place down on Singleton. I don't know how it puts it on, but it cuts the gunshot. You can't hear them, but you can still, if they come down, they could hit the top of your head and get into your skull. So we still have a problem. And I haven't heard anybody addressed it. They said they was going to look into those uh, boomerang machines that could tell where the gunfire was coming from. I'll, uh, thank you, officer. That's it. Got your input. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next individual is Teddy Williams. And please state your name and address for the record. Hi, I'm Teddy Williams, 866 Astaire Avenue, Duncanfield, Texas. I'm here to um, say first and foremost, thank you to this council um, very much for working with me and others, um, not only in my neighborhood, but all over Duncanville um, pertaining to the noise pollution um, that we're dealing with at this present time. Um, the speed enforcement signs uh, that the city manager and chief of police um, worked with me on with getting those put into Hollywood Park are working. Speed has gone down considerably. However, the noise pollution is still, um, in my opinion, a willful, um, negligent type of a situation uh, that's incumbent upon this council, the chief of police, to really and truly mitigate at this time. It's been ongoing for three years. The chief of police, um, it would really be nice if we could see a, a few more updates about how they are mitigating some of these issues because I do know that they have to see it and hear it to be able to ticket um, those who are making noise with their vehicles. Other than that, um, I would say again, I would um, highly encourage any leader who has um, any type of a report or update um, to always give us some type of an answer or they'll find an answer, but I don't know if not ever a good response. Other than that, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item number four, our consent agenda. City Secretary, would you please read the consent agenda items? Thank you, Mayor. 
Consent Agenda Item 4A, consider a resolution authorizing a cooperative purchasing agreement with Cummins Incorporated to procure an emergency generator for the new fire station 271 through source well contract 092222-CMM in the expenditure amount of $125,907. Item 4B, consider a resolution authorizing the term procurement of tree maintenance services with a PaySage Group, DBA, Smith Lawn, and Tree. In the unit amounts bid through the City of Grapevine, RFB number 515-2022 with an estimated expenditure amount of $75,000. Item 4C, consider a resolution authorizing a purchasing agreement with Park Place Motor Cars Arlington to purchase a cargo van in the expenditure amount of $79,686. Item 4D, consider a resolution authorizing an amendment to contract one, number 19-058 with Dunaway Associates LP for design services for improvements to Armstrong Park to include additional services of construction administration with an estimated expenditure of $16,500. Item 4E, consider a resolution authorizing this, the purchase of self-contained breathing apparatus SCBA from Metro Fire Apparatus Specialists Incorporated through the by board contract number 603-20 for a discounted unit price bid with an estimated expenditure amount of $276,022. Item 4F, consider a resolution authorizing the purchase of a second set of personal protective equipment, PPE, turnout gear from Casco Industries through the by board contract number 603-20 for a discounted unit price, bid with an estimated expenditure amount of $141,362 on 4G. Consider a resolution of the City Council of the City of Duncanville, Texas, ordering a joint election to be held in the City of Duncanville on Saturday, May 6, 2023, for the purpose of electing a council member at large for a two-year term, one council member from District 1 for a two-year term, one council member from District 3 for a two-year term, and one council member from District 5 for a two-year term. Considere un resolución de la ciudad de Duncanville, Texas, ordenando una elección conjunta que se llevará a cabo en la ciudad de Duncanville el sábado 6 de mayo del año 2023 para elegir un concejal general para un periodo de dos años a un concejal para el Distrito Electoral 1 por un periodo de dos años a un concejal para el Distrito Electoral 3 para un periodo de dos años y a un concejal para un, el Distrito Electoral 5 para un periodo de dos años. Thank you. On this last uh, item, I do want to let citizens know that we did discuss it in our briefing session. This also has to be translated into Vietnamese and that is in accordance with the Dallas County, the population assessment, saying the demographics in the county of Dallas need to be in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. You will see election signs to that effect. And that's why this resolution is also gonna be translated into Vietnamese. So the chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent so moved. Second. So a motion to approve by Mr. Contreras, second by Mr. Mac Burnett. Please vote. Unanimously approved, thank you. Moving on to items for individual consideration. First item is item 5A, appeal to the City Council for permitting of livestock at 1342 Main Street. Now, um, I do want to uh, do a small departure here, if I may, City Attorney. While this is not a public hearing, the individual applying for this appeal is present here with us tonight and has asked to speak. Uh, so what I'm going to do is have the presentation by Assistant uh, City Manager Brown, and then I will have uh, the applicant or the appellant, I should say, uh, more, tech more technically, to come forward and say a few words. So, Mr. Brown, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Uh, good, good evening again, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present this item. Uh, this item was placed on the agenda for uh, several reasons. Uh, first of all, we wanted the council to be aware that a written appeal has been uh, filed with our city secretary regarding the denial of a livestock um, permit. Secondly, I wanted to uh, give you a brief overview of this item. And then thirdly, we want to determine how the council would like to proceed. 
Um, the, as you said, uh, Mayor, the applicant is here. The city of Ms. Reyes is here. In my 16 years of being with the city, I don't recall us having a denial before the council. Um, so we would like to know how you would like to proceed. Um, in October of 2022, uh, the applicant filed, um, submitted a um, permit for a livestock um, permit. I'm sorry, excuse me, submitted the proper paperwork for a livestock permit. Um, this permit went before the local health authority, who is the police chief. Uh, it was denied for a number of reasons. According to our city ordinance, once it's denied, then the applicant has an opportunity to appeal to appeal committee, which is made up of the police chief, the fire chief, and myself. Uh, the committee did hear the appeal. We upheld the police chief's decision for the same reasons it was denied. And the applicant now has determined that she would like to appeal before the city council. So um, at this stage, uh, Mayor, it's really uh, how the council would like to proceed. If this is something you would like to hear this evening, if you want it to be rescheduled, but again, the applicant is present this evening. Mr. Brown, I think what we will do uh, is allow the uh, appellant to come forward and uh, allow those comments. I'm going I'm to limit those to two minutes as we've done with citizen input. And uh, we will hear that, and then I think we can have some discussion and make a decision on this. And I will call you back for any questions from council, Mr. Brown. Uh, so it is, um, I have uh, Miriam Reyes, please come forward. And please state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Miriam Reyes, and I live in 1342 South Main Street, Duncanville, Texas. Um, since I have two minutes, I would first like to thank everyone for um, listening to me. And also, um, David, he's, hopefully he's here. I haven't had the chance to thank him in person. But um, I want to appeal because these girls are part of my family. And I know we can have one livestock for um, every 5,000 square feet. Um, and currently we have 15,000 and we have four goats. So that means one of them would have to be um, confiscated and not confiscated, rehomed. But um, we have tried really hard to keep them. We have been told we couldn't appeal, then we could appeal. It's been like this long process of having hope and then getting it taken away. And I didn't have my brother here today because I know he was gonna take this really bad. I'm sorry. I don't want to cry. I know they're just goats, but um, it's it means a lot to my family right now. And um, yes, they're they're happy. They're the reason that they were um, somebody withdrew their signature is because my mom she complained about um, their dog because it was being mistreated, and then this person um, came over to our house and said that because they, they said they signed the signature and yet we called animal control on them and so they were upset that we did that to them and so they withdrew their signature, not because they're not being taken care of or loved, but because they were just upset. And although I feel bad for them, I also feel bad for the animal and I know my mom did what was right, but it's not, it's not the animal's fault. And I just, I hope that you can um, allow us to keep them. I know it's um, part of the city ordinance, but What's 5,000 more square feet? They have a lot of land. They're happy. They're not, they're pets. They're not going to be eaten. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown. In the information that we were provided, and the appellant also referenced it, um, that the there's two pieces in, in terms of the section 4-21 that I read. Uh, it's pretty specific in terms of no livestock is permitted, period. But then there's that adjunct piece that says an, an animal can be held if it has 5,000 square feet. And in some words that you wrote, in fact, uh, you, I believe it's, it's stated that, that if she were to have three, that you would have a different decision on this. Uh, because then it would be in compliance with the 5,000 per square foot per square feet for each for each animal. 
So my, my concern, my question is, is that we have one part of piece of our ordinance that says no livestock, period, but then we have something that says you can have livestock, where the goat <coughs> is included, if there's 5,000 square feet per animal. And you consented that if she would only have three, that you might have a different decision. Could you elaborate on what we, what was in our packet on that particular piece? Before? Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, as you indicated, Mayor, the, um, the ordinance is really specific regarding whether or not a permit could be approved for livestock. There's, there's two components to it. Um, as you indicated, um, 5,000 square feet per animal. And the applicant indicated that she has four goats, which she would need 20,000 right. square feet. And she indicated that she only has 15. So that would alleviate us approving it just in and of itself. Uh, the other component is, and I'll read directly from the, um, the city ordinance, it says, any person who desires to keep any livestock closer than 75 feet distance from any person's property other than his own shall apply to the local health authority for a special permit to keep the same. The applicant should provide the local health authority with proof from the owner or persons in control of all properties within 75 feet of the applicant's property that there is no objection to issuing the permit. That was not done. Okay. So we had no other choice but to uh, uphold the police chief's decision. In, on that particular aspect of, of what's written in the ordinance, I did go to uh, maps.google.com and I did look up the address and I went to the actual photo of the residence itself. And while I didn't go to it personally, I did not believe I don't believe that there's 75 feet between the residences at 1342 Main. So putting all this together, it would seem to me that the appeal process in terms of denial up to this stage has been valid and just. And the difficulty for us as a city council is to enforce what we have and with much difficulty take the emotion out of it and enforce what we have in ordinance because it's a law. So how do we enforce that law? We have to take a vote on that. Yes, so sir. I believe city council, it is up to us at this point. We presented with the information. If there's uh, no objection, uh, then I would say what we have before us is a necessity to deny this appeal as a city council. And I will take a motion to that effect. Well, Mayor, um, or can ask discuss, if we have or, any questions? Or, or more discussion. Yes, sir, okay. go ahead, sir, please. Oh, Mr. McBurnett. Yeah, I, I'd actually like to discuss it a little bit more because as, as uh, uh, Mr. Brown mentioned, it's like in all my time here, I don't remember ever hearing or seeing or something along this line. And when I was looking at this, I was like, man, there's just doesn't match up for me on, on some things. So, so I guess, and it might be a question for you, Mr. Hager, is that how old is this ordinance? Or, or uh, originally passed in 1982 and it's been amended subsequently over the years as indicated in the notes it goes back to 64 60 1970 1975 and various reiterations okay um, is there when I when I read this uh, or I, I guess it, they start off with two and now there's four is, is that correct that, I mean it, it, okay uh, did did the person voluntarily come in or what what caused them to come in for the the permit there was a our animal control officer responded to a complaint okay okay <clears throat> and I would also add councilmember Mike Burnett that um, staff recognized that the ordinance is old um, the police chief myself and the fire chief we discussed that but we did not have the authority to veer away from what's in writing uh, we are looking at that now. Uh, Chief Levigny will be meeting with uh, Mr.
Mr. Hager to determine what revisions, if any, need to be made. Okay. Uh, and, and I guess, Mr. City Attorney, I guess is there other cities or what's their ordinances or, or, is, or are we, I mean, ours is old, but are we uh, current? Are we kind of within line what's, what's there or? You're pretty much in line uh, with livestock. Uh, there has been some growing uh, synergy for chickens in the urban environment, uh, but not goats and cattle and swine and other fowl. It is pretty much routinely not allowed in the city of this size and under this configuration. Thank you. That's it for me not for now. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Contreras and Mr. Koontz. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, almost called you chief. That's okay. Um, were there, in addition to the, the basic um, violations per our ordinance, were there any uh, reported um, unhealthy living conditions for these animals back there? Uh, that animal control was involved in that you know one way or another would constitute maybe another type of violation they weren't being kept well to be no here. sir not to my knowledge uh, our animal control responded and to the best of my knowledge there were no complaints regarding the care okay. of the animals so uh, kind of going back to um, I'm a rules guy by nature but I, I'm kind of going back to Mr. McBurnett's um, question um, do we have sitting here right now any idea how many dogs you'd be able to have in a yard that size? Uh, I believe there is an ordinance. I don't recall it off the top of my head regarding the, the number. Do you recall? Okay, could we, is there a way we could quickly confirm that? I'm trying to make a point here in that if, if that number is more than three, um, which I've seen, I gotta tell you right now, I'm gonna admit I got four dogs. <laughs> um, Call animal control. I don't know. Um, the, uh, the property itself looks like it's fairly deep. It's hard to tell, and I just Google Earth it, and it looks like it's fairly deep. And I'm thinking if, if uh, someone could have um, up to four dogs, and given the breed, they could be as big as a goat, then I'm trying to make some sense out of this to be fair. So that's all I'm looking for is what, what's well, that number? I, dogs aren't livestock. They're domesticated animals. For livestock's different. You know, well, no, meat, no. milk, it's a different kettle of fish than a pet. I understand. And by definition, under your ordinance, even if you allowed 20 dogs, these aren't dogs. Well, the ordinance has an appeal process for a reason, and that's what we're talking about right but now. But that's arbitrary, and you're gonna violate your own ordinance. So you're, are you advising us? I'm giving you legal advice. You can do as you please. No, I wanna hear your legal advice. My then. legal advice is, you can't apply the standards for dogs and cats because they are treated differently in your ordinance. Now, if you want to go back and change the ordinance, that's, sh again, your purview to do that. No, you made a good and, point. And, and if, you, if you, as a body, are of mind to do that, then you need to not make a decision about this and go back and change the ordinance. I understand. And not violate what you've written and what your predecessors because now it's a dangerous precedent because if I come in here tomorrow and I was a neighbor, then I have three beef cattle that I want to move into my backyard. Now what are you going to do? Well, I understand. Thank you for okay. your legal advice. Mr. Koontz. Mr. Koontz. Thank you, Mayor. So, uh, 
so my understanding is that the applicant did get the required signatures from yeah, no, from sir, neighbors? the applicant did not get the no. required signatures. Okay. I, in the, the staff report, uh, it says the applicant, let's see. Okay, I'll, I'll have to go back and, and find where, where I read that. There, um, was, there was one um, resident, um, Councilmember McCoons, who initially um, signed off and um, she changed her mind. Okay, well, I, I just mis misread that. Thank you. And so my other question is, do, do we know how long that the, go the goats or that the animals have been residing on this property? Uh, no, sir, Prior I don't to know the, the exact time. I, I believe that this process has been going on several months. Uh, I want to believe it started um, in the spring of last year. Uh, our animal control officer responded, uh, spoke with the applicant, gave the applicant uh, an opportunity to relocate the goats. That did not happen, and so the process continued from there. Oh, is it, or can, can we ask the applicant? Absolutely, yes, sir. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, so exactly, or about how long have the goats or the, the animals resided on the property pr prior to y'all applying for the permit? So we got the mom and the dad um, on March 28th of 2021. And then um, they, we weren't planning on them having babies, but they had twins May, um, not May, it was um, January 25th of last year. So they just turned one year old. And yeah, so we've had them for two years, about to be two years oh. in March oh. total. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I found, so in the, the staff report, it says, after a lengthy process, the applicants presented the signatures to the local health authority. And it refers, I guess, it sounds like there was more than one signature there, but you're saying that was just one signature? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and, and then <coughs> in, in the letter that we got from you, the, so the option is uh, to either, at least our current option, uh, to reduce or either to relocate the goats to another location or reduce the number of goats from four to three. So we're talking about one, one animal here is what's making the difference. Well, that's, that's part of it, yes, sir. If you reduce the number of goats from four to three, you meet one component of the um, city ordinance that's in violation, but you also need the signatures from all the residents that are within 75 feet from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the property. Oh. That's it for my questions, but but I would like to uh, ask the council to entertain uh, revisiting the ordinance itself and maybe seeing if there might be some updates we need to make there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to count on, on the next person that had a, a comment, Mr. Veracruz. I will say at this point, I am not inclined to do so. I think we have an ordinance, we have a law, it's our job to enforce it. Uh, Mr. Veracruz. Thank you, Mayor. I was just going to say uh, basically the same thing, just revisit the um, the ordinance because with uh, updated times, PTSD, so on and so forth, there's different sources of um, rules and ordinances that allow different types of animals. Now I know this is a livestock into restaurants, hotels, Home Depot. And so that's, that's just my comment. Thank you. Uh, back to Mr. Contreras and then Mr. McBurnett has another comment. Yes, <coughs> I just want to stand uh, corrected. Uh, with, as Mr. Uh, Koontz was answering his question, I got clarification that I misunderstood that they didn't have the appropriate number of signatures. Yes, sir. So that was part of the decision yes, sir. to decline. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. McBurnett. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm thinking about this process, and, and so when we're talking about signatures, uh, I mean, they've had it, 
and I guess October 22nd is when they w went in for the uh, to obtain the permit. Yes, sir. So how much time are they given to obtain signatures? Um, I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head, sir. Okay, see, see, attorney, is it addressed in the ordinance at all? And stuff? No, it is uh, not. I would assume that if, and I realize I'm a lawyer, but I, I would think I would get those signatures before I made the application. Because we're all presumed to know the law, and the law says you have to have the signatures of everyone within 75 feet, so I would gather those before I made the application. But I do, there's nothing in the ordinance that specifically addresses it to answer your question. Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor, I'm along with Mr. Coons. I, I think we ought to uh, table this and have it potentially. Well, I disagree at this point. I have well, another question. I'm, I'm not finished speaking, sir. Um, I, I think we should table this, and I think we should revisit the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. I continue to disagree. Uh, I have a question for the appellate, for the appellate please. I looked up this property on the Dallas County Appraisal District uh, uh, records, and I looked for the owner of the property. Are you the owner of the property? No. Who is? My father. So you're a dependent? Yes, sir. You have no ownership in this property? No, sir. Thank you. Mr. Harvey? <coughs> uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I am hearing council members voices going both ways on this issue I'd like for each council member to be polled to see if they think it right to revisit the ordinance. In other words, I'd like to appeal what the mayor said. Fair shot. Uh, go by uh, numerical order and come back to you at the end, Mr. Uh, Harvey is at large. So uh, polling. What we're doing now is taking consensus poll. We're not taking a vote, we're taking a consensus poll on whether this ordinance should be revisited, which is going to put this process in stall for an inordinate amount of time. So, Mr. Veracruz, would you like to re have this revisited? And, and basically, we're going to table this. Okay? So, that is the question. Mr. Veracruz, do you, Veracruz, do you wish to table this and have the ordinance revisited? Yes. Mr. Ver McBurnett? Yes. Mr. Coons? Yes. Ms. Cherry? Yes. Mr. Contreras? Yes. Mr. Harvey? Sure. Negative on mine. That's a six to one. This is tabled. Thank you. May I can ask and the ordinance will be revisited. If our staff responds to a complaint, how, how, should, they, how should they handle I that? Have no, I have no idea. Because now we have an ordinance in effect in which the law is being disregarded. So I cannot answer that question for you, Mr. Brown. Uh, the, the Somebody else. I, I take exception to the fact that you're judging that we are disregarding the law. No one here has mentioned anything about disregarding the law. We ask for something that's within our abilities and our rights to ask for. Fine. Very good. Thank you very much. Moving on to item 5B, conduct a public hearing 2022-36 for consideration and action regarding the request of Rick James, applicant and owner to rezone, to change zoning from a planned development district and local office slash retail district to a new planned development district, and to rezone to change zoning from a planned development district and local office retail district to general office or retail district, and adopt an ordinance to change the comprehensive zoning ordinance and map on 1A and PT Lot 2A, Block 1, Marywood Edition, Lots 1A and 2A, Marywood Edition, Lot 1, Block 1, James Memorial Edition, and PT TR 23 ACS 3, 1562A, Slayback ABST 1299 PG 880, more commonly known as 803, 807, 809, and 811, South Cockrell Hill Road in the city of Duncanville, Texas. Mr. Warren, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mayor, Council. This is a request for zoning change at 803, 807, 809, and 811 South Cockrell Hill Road. The request is a zoning change to allow for an accessory use of a parking garage for the purpose of an existing funeral home business. The future land use map designation is retail commercial. The current zoning districts are local office retail district, 
and plan development district. The proposed zoning districts are general office retail district and a new plan development district. In this image, we see the four, uh, four properties, 803, 807, 809, and 811 South Crockett Hill Road. 809 and 803 make up the portions of the northern lot, and 807 and 811 make up the portions of the southern lot. The zoning request, well, let's back up. In blue, we have a, a PD, a plan development district, and the portions in red are LOR, uh, local office retail districts. Now the zoning change request of the subject properties being 803 South Cargo Hill Road and 809 South Cargo Hill Road, those are the, prop the lot on the north, are the request is to be a new plan development district. The subject properties 807 South Cargo Hill Road and 811 South Cargo Hill Road, those are the lot on the south. Uh, this new lot is proposed to be LOR, local office retail, or GOR, excuse me. Uh, totally GOR. Those are the two zoning requests. This is a zoning exhibit showing the existing uh, layout of, of, uh, the, of the property. In the darker gray lot on the north, you see three existing structures, uh, well, three existing single family structures and one accessory, accessory, dwelling, accessory a unit and then the lot on the south you see the existing Jane's uh, Chapel and the proposed structure where Marywood used to be where there's no existing structure today this is a zoomed in image of what we just looked at where we have three existing houses and existing building to the north this area in darker gray is the proposed new plan development district and the lot to the south is proposed to be GOR general office retail. Shown in these two uh, in this image here we have the portion that is proposed in red to be uh, plan development district and the portion in uh, the southern lot in the bluish green indicates GOR. That's lot one block R and lot one R one block one to the north. And here we have a site plan showing the, uh, ex the proposed uh, development on the southern lot the lot 1R, block 1, with the accessory structure and the, ex and the existing James Chapel. 30 mailings were sent out. We had three replies in favor. We had no replies in opposition. Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval by a vote of 4 to 1. Thank you, staff will stand for the question. Thank you. Uh, the way this process is, uh, is operated is that public hearing, we have the opening by the staff member. We then open it up to a public hearing, and I, op I will open the public hearing. Then each individual, each, those individuals who wish to speak in favor will be granted 10 minutes in the aggregate. Those individuals who wish to speak in opposition will be granted 10 minutes in the aggregate to speak as well. We will then close the public hearing we will then reopen it up to discussion by city council and then take a vote on it. So at this point, I'm going to open up the public hearing. The timestamp on this is 834. Any individuals present who wish to speak in favor of this particular item, please come forward. Seeing none, closing this portion of the public hearing for those who wish to speak in favor. I'm opening at the I at 830. 834 again. Uh, opening those who wish to speak in opposition to this item, please come forward. And I do have a card here from an Emily Bridges. Is Emily Bridges present? 
Emily Bridges uh, did have here. She said, I do not wish to speak, but please record my opposition to this particular item. Individuals not present. So seeing no individuals present to wish to speak in opposition to this item, I'm closing uh, this portion of the public hearing at the timestamp of 835. I will take a motion to close the public hearing in its entirety from someone on council. So moved. I have a move so to approve, close the public hearing. We'll Second. Next. Second by Mr. Koontz. Please vote on closing the public hearing. Thank you. Public hearing is closed at 835. May Mayor Gordon, just by way of uh, this is a little different. We don't actually have an ordinance prepared tonight because there was two components. It's almost two zoning cases. So if the council's in favor of the presentation and the recommendation of P and Z, I will construct two ordinances uh, for our next meeting to be put on the consent agenda if it passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. So uh, it is now time for the council to have any further discussion on this item. Seeing no discussion required or desired, uh, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the item as presented knowing that the ordinances will be crafted and presented at a later date by our city attorney. So moved. Second. We have a motion to approve by Mr. McBurnett, a second by Mr. Contreras. Please vote. Item is unanimously approved. Thank, Thank you very you. much. That concludes the, our agenda. We have no staff and board reports. Therefore, the completion of all our business tonight, the meeting is adjourned at 836.